I gotta mute this computer or else I get an echo. Oh, I can't mute it. Why can't I mute? Can't I have mute. no idea, but we should be basically live any moment now. I think we are, in fact, already. We are live. It's like 17 oh. seconds of past. I'm just trying to make sure that the whole thing is not actually... Okay, we're live. Hiding. Yeah, I think we're, yeah, live. Yeah, we're live. Yeah, we're live. We're live. Yeah, we're good. Okay. Cool. Lovely job. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Like oiled and... machine here, guys. <laughs> yeah. The best, the best. <laughs> okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my show. My name is Ake Rex, uh, and uh, we have Harry. Hello. We have Josh. Hello. And uh, today we're going to continue our discussion of the Australian uh, uh, prehistoric fauna, uh, taking over from the last stream. Uh, so that's a direct follow-up. If you are not caught up, if you're new here, first of all, make sure you catch up to the previous uh, stream to be kept fully up to date. And uh, also subscribe to the channel, or press the like button, and uh, make sure to check out some other links that are included in the description, like Harry's pages, uh, Josh's pages, and my own, uh, including the Indiegogo campaign I'm currently running. Now, uh, I'm going to pretty much mostly hand over the whole thing to Harry and Josh, and we'll only intervene in a few minor moments. So treat it as if it's their show. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> for, for all intents and purposes. And also, uh, now that we are at it, Josh, did you want to do a quick uh, recap of uh, the last stream? Well, here, here's how much of a well-oiled machine we are, because I got caught up in our, in our pre-show setup that I forgot the power cord to this laptop that I'm using. So I'm going to run off and grab that if you two want to carry the show for a quick second. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, we're fine with that. It's, uh, it's I'll be right back. back. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so... Uh, Harry, uh, would you be kind enough then to uh, remind us of what sort of main points that we covered in the previous stream that led us up to here? Well, I think the main, main point um, that I wanted to keep making about prehistoric Australia is that it's a big lost world of, in like by lost world standards. So during the Mesozoic, we had animals particularly dinosaurs and, and amphibians, we even managed to have the same family group as Prionosuchus survive into the Cretaceous era, which is insane. That's like having a Tyrannosaurus living today. Um, I might mention we actually still have monotremes living in Australia today, so that's something as well. And of course, they were alive throughout that entire time, more or less, um, or at least they probably appeared during the, when the dinosaurs did, and apparently so did marsupials. Um, or at least the ancestor of marsupials. We can't actually tell if they're true marsupials because marsupials have a pouch. I'll get into that in a minute. But um, a lot of the animals in Australia were very proto versions of certain dinosaurs. They We have proto um, ankylosaurians that were so basal that they're pretty much put at the very bottom, you know, most early part of the tree of, Ankylosauria and similar cases with a lot of other dinosaurs. We have early types of titanosaurs. We also have possibly the biggest type of titanosaur. Um, and it sounds like Josh is back. I can't tell. Um, yeah, but yes, you're, you're like, on the solo screens right now, but I will get it back to the multiple screen shortly. You're okay. Because, um, yeah, there are definitely things um, that Josh needs to show. Um, but overall, we had. <laughs> Are we of, doing the recap? <laughs> yes, we're doing the recap. I'm happy for you to take over. I just wanted to, I just was hammering that point about everything being proto proto dinosaurs and early versions of animals. That will continue this episode a little bit, or at least you'll get some really weird um, time anomalies, but I'll go into that later. Josh, take over. Okay, yeah, no. So, what? It, how, how far into the recap did we go? <laughs> um, oh, just uh, basically the proto ankylosaurus, the the fact that a lot of the animals are very early versions of the families they come from, and I also mentioned the amphibian as well. Okay, cool. cool. So, so we're doing so. Okay, so to recap, guys, to recap, to recap. Yep. So we got. Well, I don't really have. It's okay. I got a good memory. Uh, so we got the galloping ankylosaurus. Yep, that's, that's Mimi. Problem. So that's in Australia. We got Kulasukas, one of the giant amphibians that makes a cameo in the Super Mario Brothers two. 
mm -hmm. comic book. Uh, we have, uh, you guys had giant ankylos, uh, not ankylos, uh, we got giant titanosaurs, so we know they were big. Yep. You guys still, you guys have uh, um, one of the largest uh, sauropod footprints out there, so that's what, how we know we got big titanosaurs. Yep. Um, we know the world was ruled by these guys. Um, so there's a lot of mega raptors. Mm -hmm. Those are the mega raptor claw. So we know we had a lot of mega raptors. Um, you guys had pterosaurs. Yep. Uh, you guys had a few creatures. And then uh, we talked about the ocean. So you guys had um, you guys had um, ichthyosaurs. Yeah, we had ichthyosaurs. We had a uh, Chronosaurus, the big guy. Yep. Chronosaurus queen landicus. Um, and then finally, you guys talked about Xiphanthinus, which was really yes. wild. So that's that's the one thing I wanted to carry over. So I, I dug this guy out of my storage. Hold on. <laughs> Oh, and just to clarify, um, the animal we have is a close relative to Zyphactinus, or at least it's so practically morphologically identical. So just a little smaller. Nice. Yeah. Keep it there for a minute, please. Okay, so, so this, 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 believe it or not, not love. <laughs> yeah, this is a very small Zyphactinus. <laughs> let, let me try to back up here. So this is a small one, if you could believe it. These guys got a lot bigger. Um, so yeah, this is a big fish. This is like a, like a barracuda on steroids. This is what this guy was. We have a skull here in LA. Uh, they're very common around Kansas, the interior seaway. Uh, but these guys were huge. Um, you can see if you guys have a problem distinguishing this, because this is a, a crushed skull casting of the fossil. So the other side actually has the rest of the skull. Um, so this is the jaw right here. These are the main teeth right here. Uh, this is actually a part of, I'm trying to, there we go, a part of the upper jaw. So that's kind of uh, pushed that way. That's the that's the eye socket. I'm doing everything backwards. I got to get my brain trained again. <laughs> so if I flip it back, you can see more of those features. So that's the eye socket. That's the top jaw piece. So this piece right here would be nestled right about here. And then you can see all the teeth that go into there. And you can see those huge fangs. Um, so these are big guys. Like these these are big fish. These things, they, they were cannibalistic. We found Xiphanthinus with other Xiphanthinus fossilized inside of them because uh, they were feeding on each other. Um, we know this because uh, the other Xiphanthinus was entering through the mouth. Uh, so it's pretty black and white. <laughs> <laughs> so, so harry so how, what uh what species do you have because you said it's a smaller cousin of this fish right uh yep that's right I'm <laughs> I'm i think uh, the american species is uh, odox i think is that what it is yeah, oh, so yeah. I think it's odox is uh, the big main species that we get uh, here in north america okay from uh, uh this uh, awesome book again Okay, it's cool. Kuyu Australis. It's uh, this one. Oh, cool. Very cool. And it's, yeah, very, very, very similar. I'd be pretty amazed if it wasn't. They did actually talk a bit about Zephactinus a bit in this book, but I don't think we actually had a true Zephactinus. We just had fish that were anatomically very similar. I'm pretty sure we're just related because this looks like a Zephactinus to me as well. Um, and we have uh, Pachyrosidus um, caninus as well. Um, oh, that's a the, cool fish. Yeah. yeah that's, that's a really nice one. And we had a few other ones as well. Like we had a um, Richmond ichthys, which was pretty big and uh, about, you know, I'd say four meters long. There's no picture of it. And we also had a giant jumbo monster sized lungfish. And yes, yeah, so a long fish that you know can breathe on land, but they're kind of here we are. There's a size comparison, Metaceratodus, uh, well, stony. Anyone can oh, see very that? Cool. Oh, yeah, yeah. well, so, look at that. It shows it's as big as a person, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> probably true. So, yeah, very so. Cool. 
a lot of things we have, um, with, so because, you know, Australia is mostly underwater and obviously animals that live in the sea are, happy, are free to travel to Australia's coasts and inland seas, we get a lot of similar stuff to the rest of the world. We got a, all different types of plesiosaurs of different shapes and sizes, including long neck ones, including a very strange basal one, whose name I completely forgot. Um, and of course the Chronosaurus, and we had some Mosasaurs as well. And you'll and find going into the um, Cenozoic, a lot of very close relatives of familiar animals, including probably just those animals based on how the evidence looks, they also came over to Australia as well in Australia's seas. The land's a different story, but we'll get into that in a sec. So anything else we want to cover from the recap? Yeah, this is heavy. I think you're all to put it down. <laughs> yeah, unlike unlike the Mega Raptor Claw, which I kept up there through the entire stream. This guy I gotta have to put away. So but if you want to get more on look at it. Uh, so this is one last look at our Xiphanthinus uh, skull casting. This is a big boy. Um and uh, yeah, it's one of the prettier skull castings I got. Um, I believe a museum in Wisconsin made these available to the public. Uh, so this is casted off the actual fossil. It's very unique. I haven't seen any Xiphanthinus skull castings like this. Uh, so yeah, this is uh, this is a small one, if you can imagine that. Um, and they got bigger. Uh, so yeah, uh, from there we can, uh, if you want to stay in the ocean, we got more stuff. So as we go from the Cenozoic, uh, no, no. From we go into from the Mesozoic. Just quickly to ask something before you get into the next bit. Um, just wanted yeah. to ask the replica. Is this um, when you mentioned the uh, museum in Wisconsin? Are you by any chance referring to the Carthage College where Thomas Carr works? No. No, a different one. Okay, no worries. Yeah. But shout out to Thomas Carr. Shout out to Thomas Carr still. <laughs> yes. <laughs> He's been a guest on the channel as well. I hope to have him back some uh, someday as well again. So I'm gonna I'm putting this guy away. This thing is huge. Um, yeah. Oh. He served as well. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Sorry. You feel free to get into the next part uh, before I interrupt it. Okay. So now we're in the Cenozoic. So we're we're, we're successfully we re we recapped galloping ankylosaurus, titanosaurus, mega raptors, Iphanthinus, um, Pulosuchus, because we don't get enough amphibian coverage. Mm -hmm. um, so now we we've traditionally traveled forward in time now we're in the cenozoic uh so what are we looking at in the cenozoic now do we do we stay in the oceans do we play in the water a little bit yeah play in the water a bit <laughs> oh okay um oh yeah think? sorry <laughs> the oiled machine guy yep. <laughs> In fact, someone someone's texting me right now. Shout out to Maddie; oh, she's my friend. So, um, uh, right, yeah. Take this one. <laughs> um, okay, so in the oceans, um, well, this is an interesting part because in the um, Cenozoic, the exact opposite happened, and our oceans dropped substantially. So we know quite a bit less about oceanic animals. We have found um, a tooth. Um, actually, obviously, you find a lot of teeth. We found obviously megalodon teeth of some sh some sort. I'm pretty sure it's just megalodon. Um, nice. Megalodon, and uh, and I think you have the uh, the megalodon tooth, don't you? Like Josh, I do. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, you can't you can't just passively mention a megalodon without um, without kind of properly staying on the subject for a little while. Uh, so for for people who know Megalodon, yes, that's the giant shark in the movie with Jason Stratham. Absolutely not a documentary. Um, and uh, what we have here is, I think this is a, one of the larger fossil castings of a Megalodon tooth. Um, it's dark. I'm trying to get it on a light background, but you can see how big this guy is. Um, that's That's a pretty big shark. Uh, th this oh. is why they're estimated to be as large as they are. Um, For a quick comparison, things... um, probably hold up your other hand doing the OK symbol. The OK symbol? Yeah. Um, a normal great white shark would to fit inside the your finger <laughs> and thumb, just to give a difference in size. Oh, yeah. No, here, this was like 
I, I mean, I actually have other shark teeth here. Um, but I mean, yeah, this this tooth is like one of the largest shark teeth ever to be discovered. I actually have real shark teeth here too. This is actual real meg fossil uh, wow. that I could put against the size cast. And you can see there's still a substantial size estimate. Um, and funny enough, these were all castings and fossils that we brought out during our interview with Steve Elton. This is probably the largest of the meg shards that I have which you can see is about the same size as the casting. So that's sizing up pretty well. Um, but these are big sharks. The, there's nothing that compares with them today. Um, rough estimate, they were the size of a whale shark. The whale shark is the largest shark species that we have alive today. Um, and um, the, these things were huge. Like it, Megalodon seems to be a predator that all, like pretty much dominated the sea while it was around, I believe the Miocene or the Eocene is it's, it's Miocene. like, yeah. is it Miocene? Yeah, the Miocene is like a particular niche and then they survived further, I think, till um, mm. a couple of hundred thousand years ago, right? Like they're still trying to debate the latest found yeah. Megalodon tooth. Wow. Yeah, they were very recent. Um, the probably earliest time of death um would probably be like maybe one or two million years ago which is insane that's like roughly when humans appeared or yeah. you know maybe when the modern when the first african elephants appeared i mean that's very recent in terms yeah. of history and that's no, like, that's hmm. yeah <laughs> yeah no it's pretty cool like what where um Arson, if you want to throw up some art, um, that way I can pick Harry's brain. Yeah, sure. Uh, sure. Which ones you want to? Uh, but uh, Harry, when when do you think uh, like the the bone beds? What what specific bone beds do you guys find Meg teeth in specifically? Uh, I honestly don't know. Um, I'm going to guess Queensland um, and Northern Territory because that's usually where all the fossils are. I think um, it's hard to actually say. For certain, we did get some low tide areas, but it's been a very, um, yeah, as I said, I think it's just a few odd meg teeth here and there. I can't actually answer that question. I just heard that, yeah, we did actually get a few meg teeth. And <laughs> these sharks just swim around the world. I do know that they seem to, the younger ones converge in North America. And uh, also that said, the biggest adults converge there. So it's probably where the adults give birth to live young and the young just start spreading out but um yeah i think we get you know kind of more average sized ones oh and speaking of which that art there which is awesome by the way um we also potentially maybe get leviathan as well we actually have found some teeth that look pretty much just like leviathan teeth but obviously we just have the teeth but you know it's they're huge what else are they going to be if not a very <laughs> close relative of that same animal so we also get something very much like that as well. Smaller, but still like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's really cool. Like, Arson, if you want to switch to the close up of that shot, uh, which shows the heads. Um, so, for those people who don't know, Leviathan is a huge, uh, like, hyper raptoral whale that was found in Peru initially. Um, and they since found the skull. But for a while, they found these huge teeth. So, they were. Um, this again goes into size estimates, uh, Harry, which is something we touched up on last mm. uh, last session. So, oh no, that picture was nah. that picture was fine. Sorry, <laughs> just clicked the wrong button. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Just yeah, butterfingers. They, uh, they, they, they found these huge uh, fossil whale teeth, mm. and they said it was from a sperm whale, a type of prehistoric sperm whale. So. What they did is they compared the sperm whale teeth for Leviathan to modern day sperm whale teeth, and they ended up just scaling up a sperm whale, like without <laughs> like without altering the proportions or anything. Because when they found the teeth, they were like, these teeth are so huge, there's no way these teeth fit into a medium sized skull. Mm -hmm. And then they found the Leviathan skull, and then they realized, oh, wait, this was just a whale with ridiculously large teeth. Like the teeth are so weird because. Um, I don't have one of them, but on the top tooth, there's a notch in the physical tooth. And what that notch was for was so the other teeth could rest into that notch. 
Oh, wow. Because they were just so big and massive. Um, and right here you see a rough comparison of the size of those teeth with a meg. Uh, this is like a, a large estimate for both animals. I think both animals are pushing, give or take, like 13 meters. Oh, um, and um, that's the that's the overall agreed estimate for both of these animals. Like megalodon, we've actually found a few more megalodon fossils. I believe there's a megalodon skeleton that's on display uh, in Germany or, or Switzerland, somewhere over there, but. They also think that it's a chimera mount. So it's a mount that was pieced together from two different skeletons, but it's still the most evidence that we have for a megalodon skeleton. So we're actually finally getting megalodon skeletons finally. Um, they believe the skeletons of a chubutensis, so it's megalodon chubutensis, is a younger cousin of megalodon carcaricles. Um, but we're now finding that just like, the, just like Leviathan and the tooth estimates, uh, megalodon, it might be the same case where you just have a giant predator with very big teeth versus just scaling up a great white shark, which Megalodon, funny enough, I don't think is even related to great white sharks anymore. It's it's more yeah. closer related to mako sharks and sand tiger sharks, um, which is what inspired me with this piece was to do more sand tiger and mako shark features versus just getting a great white shark and just blowing it up to those proportions. Yep. Um, so that's really fascinating that you guys are getting uh, a leviathan uh, type animals out there with these giant teeth. Like, how big do they? Do they mention how big these teeth are that you guys are finding? Um, they were nowhere near as big as uh, leviathan's teeth. In like, you know, those things are like the size of a human leg. You know, like at least <laughs> these are probably more about half that size. I think. Um, so they definitely weren't the larger size by a long shot. They were more shrunk down by about, you know, two thirds to a half of that size. So, but they were definitely big. They would, would have been much larger than any orca today. And they would have definitely been a, a substantially massive predator as well. Just obviously not like maximum meg, maximum Leviathan size. They would have been, you know, probably maybe humpback whale size, maybe, or smaller. Yeah, now these, um, I mean, it, it's so it's so weird to talk about whales and just kind of say, like, oh, they're humpback whale size, not realizing, yeah. like, that's, that's still a big animal. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, and an idea of, okay, um, blue whale, sperm whale, humpback, roughly. So, and, yeah, Leviathan was probably, and Megalodon were estimated somewhere halfway between a full-size sperm whale and a humpback, um, and a full-size humpback. So they're probably more in this strange middle area. They're bigger than a lot of filter-feeding whales, but obviously compared to a sperm whale, they'd probably be, I don't know, two-thirds to half the size, taking into account all the mass and stuff. But I'd say some people suggest that, you know, this is based on very large estimates of the sperm whale. A lot of them are much smaller. They're like 14 meters long, and that's probably the size of a medium size one of either of these animals. So um, <laughs> that's something to keep in mind as well. There's a lot of variability in size of any animal in the ocean. They seem to find the right food source and they double their size. That's just the rule of thumb. It seems to happen with <laughs> whales, seems to happen with sharks, obviously reptiles too, although oceanic reptiles aren't. Um, quite a thing even though we actually do have a crocodile that likes to swim in the sea as part of its normal routine <laughs> yeah now you guys have the salt water croc so yes <laughs> uh, and that's probably a good uh i reckon that's a good bridge into like maybe we could start talking about the reptiles and stuff um, well, real fast, i want to do some shout outs because uh, we have the live chat going on yes yes uh, so we have gray this is his full name by the way uh we have Gray ideal to La Florida, La Florida, um, or X bubble song king. Uh, okay, so that guy, uh, I'm gonna call him Gray. Gray, uh, <laughs> hey, Gray. So he said he uh, he asked if we were going to be featuring more art. Here you go, Gray. Uh, Martin, Martin is here. Martin says Josh's art gives me life. Thank you, Martin. Uh, he also notes that, um, a Leviathan. And this uh, this hyper raptoral rail was named after Moby Dick, which is true. Yeah. 
Um, so if you want to throw up that other piece of art, Arson, where I have the two uh, Leviathan pieces side by side, one's just pale white, one has more natural coloring. So for those people who don't know, the full scientific name of Leviathan is Leviathan Melvillier. That's named after Herman Melville, who wrote Moby Dick. So when I first heard about this whale, um, I did two, this piece, which was one was... Um, this was meant to be cover art for something. It never happened, sadly. Maybe one day it will. Um, but this was one version was it's more natural color. So we think more brown and light tan on the bottom. Um, and then the other version was actually based off Herman Melville, the great white whale. Um, and there mm -hmm. you can see it feeding on a uh, filter feeding whale. Because we think these animals, uh, just like orcas do today, orcas or the killer whale feed on other whales. We, be, we believe Leviathan was kind of a, again, a terminator version of an orca, even though it was related to the sperm whale. It's a sperm whale that ate other whales, whereas current day yeah. sperm whales eat squid, um, primarily squid. These whales ate other whales. These were whale eating whales. <laughs> yeah, bite force would have just actually crushed body flat. That's, they're like, the real deal, these things. Yeah. They wouldn't had to wear their prey down. They probably could have just bitten into it once and probably just killed it straight there unless it was really robustly built or really big, I think. Yeah. The... <laughs> yeah, no, they're definitely like, uh, I think Martin even says, I think they're the largest functioning teeth of any animal, not including tusks. Um, I, I might have to fact check that, but that might be right. Like just as, in terms of sheer giant teeth, um, I'm sure like proportionally... I don't know, maybe hippos have some of the largest teeth proportionally, but as, as far as the actual largest teeth uh, for predation, I think Leviathan actually has the largest teeth for predation of any animal that I know of, um, even bigger than T-Rex teeth. And T-Rex teeth are big. Yep, um, they're bigger than Meg teeth as well, <laughs> as a matter of fact. Oh yeah, I think um, when the first, when the first, um, when the first, paper hit i think it had a rough size of like 16 inches like 16, 16 inch teeth that's that's insane like a rex tooth for people that don't know at its largest is maybe a foot maybe 12 inches maybe 11 inches with the root Do we count right the too. roots or only crowns no with the root um with just the crown i think they are like average six inches or so um but a meg tooth like this tooth right here it's not that big. And this is one of the biggest teeth. And um, people have a way of measuring meg teeth. I measure them top to bottom. People measure them like end to end, which is how you get these size discrepancies with the teeth. Um, you, you get into megalodon debates and you get these kids that are like, no, it was 17 inches. And it's because they're measuring it wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I do a true measurement. I'm just like top to bottom, guys. That's that's what I measure. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this tooth right here is give or take um, five or six inches. That's 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 one of the biggest megalodon teeth is give or take six inches. I've heard rumors that they're seven inches, but even then, that's that's still a far cry from sixteen inch teeth. Like sixteen inch teeth is a big tooth for any animal. Um, so Leviathan was definitely pushing the limits as far as predation tooth size, what it can do with those teeth. Uh, this was an animal that was pushing all new limits. Um, as you can tell, I'm a bit of a Leviathan fanboy. <laughs> Good reason. Oh, yeah, they're very cool animals. Can we um, just uh, explode, you know, allow the chat to blow up and start spamming about who do they think would win, Megalodon or Leviathan, and just have a go with one another over that? Just like, who's, <laughs> who's the team Megalodon, who's the team Leviathan? Right, this, this is the new Kong versus Godzilla. It's, it's Leviathan versus Meg. <laughs> yep. Let's go. I'm actually, I'm, I'm actually pro uh, Leviathan because we do have instances of, sh of um, whales that do hunt sharks. Uh, great, uh, great white sharks fall prey to orcas all the time. I think even false killer whales, which are a smaller cousin of the orca, are known to feed on sharks. Um, and they're a little bit smaller than an orca. Uh, so 
we we do have instances of these animals. What they do is they flip the shark over and induce what's known as tonic immobility. Oh no! Did we lose Harry? Um, we might have. Uh, yes, I no! don't know. I just Escape. keep going. He uh, he's gonna um, uh, he should be able to click the invite. The space open. time continuum strikes again, guys. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Let me quickly right resend him the invite link, and he'll join back up. Um, but um, oh, yeah, yeah, he's here. He's here. Okay, cool. We so, lost you there. <laughs> yeah. So this is another fact about Australia. Even our internet's archaic. So anyway, <laughs> back into action. Um. But uh, when whales hunt sharks, what they do is they flip the shark over and they induce something known as tonic immobility. Oh, yeah. Uh, so what that means is once a shark is flipped over, it becomes paralyzed. It's it's powerless. It's really strange. Wow. Um, yeah. And, and even some shark handlers do it to sharks just to show off the ability of inducing tonic immobility. So if we're talking about a whale versus a shark, because whales are very smart animals, they have some of the largest brains of mm. any mammal, um, including humans. I've seen a comparison of a sperm whale brain next to a human brain. It's pretty, it's pretty, uh, it puts you into perspective pretty fast. Um, no, not that big. <laughs> well, they're not basketball size, aren't they? Well, they're pretty big. I like the largest sperm whale brain I've seen is maybe a third bigger than the size of a human brain. Wow. Um, but it's also about the wrinkles in the brain. Uh, so if you have a wrinkly brain, that means you can store more surface information, more sur over a larger surface area. Uh, sperm whales have big brains, uh, but they're not too wrinkly, but they're still big brains. Um, same thing for pachyderms. Pachyderms have like one of the largest brains out there, uh, elephants for people. And um, so we're, we're talking about an animal that was smart. It could it could strategize. It, um, orcas hunt in packs. I think Leviathan wouldn't need a hunt in a pack, but I think the Leviathan could put a megalodon into tonic immobility to kind of finish off. But the Meg would also have an advantage as far as um, a breaching. That's the method of hunting where they're up, where they're, they're below, and they spot a target up below and they just rock it up to it. Uh, so it it would definitely be a case of like who gets the drop on who, yep. like what animal gets the drop on the other animal that might do the killing blow. It's like um, mm -hmm. it's it's like a western show off who gets the first shot and gets to hit yep. the target that, that basically wins the fight. Yeah, yep. pretty much. Yeah, and then uh, Martin also said that um, if, uh, orcas hunt sharks for their livers. That's absolutely true. They. They do mm. hunt the livers. It's really fascinating. In fact, there was a, um, which is why I'm thinking that Leviathan wasn't hunting sharks uh, predominantly uh, because they did a study on orca whales and shout out to Meredith Riven, who is a paleontologist that I used to uh, uh, hang out with at the Cooper Center. I think now she's up north in Washington with her family. Uh, she did a paper. Uh, or she not she didn't do a paper, but she she turned me on to a paper that was on the tooth morphologies of great white sharks, depending on what they were feeding. And sh uh, great whites that were feeding on whales had an average tooth size. Great whites that were hunting fish actually had a larger tooth size, so they were hyper. Their teeth were getting hyper large, and then. Orcas that were feeding on sharks actually started seeing teeth that were being filed down flat because orcas were ripping into shark skin. And for those people who have touched shark skin, it's like sandpaper. Uh, so orcas were pretty much filing their teeth down flat because they were hunting sharks so much. And there's 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 a paper out there. I don't have the citation, but it's a paper that's out there that shows you like that's how they could tell which whales were hunting which prey items predominantly. Enter Leviathan. I don't think we've have too many Leviathan finds, but we do have some big finds. But I, I've yet to see a case where Leviathan teeth were filed down flat. Because if you get Leviathan teeth that were being filed down to a nub, that's usually an indication that the animal was feeding on skates or sharks because the teeth were being filed down by the shark skin while they were ripping the shark open. So that's a bunch of fun facts for you guys. <laughs> yeah, that is amazing. That is an amazing fact. Yeah, no, it's pretty cool. Like marine fauna is pretty cool. I used to live by the ocean for a few years. It was a lot of fun to just 
visit all the aquariums and hit hit the shore. But uh, okay, so yeah, we dwelt we dwelled on these guys uh, for a while. I've fanboyed enough. Uh, wh where do we move on next? I reckon uh, let's go on to the reptiles because we can do a quick um, capture of, of one that's been around throughout the pretty much the entire time and it's still alive today. The saltwater crocodile, which I only go on a bit because we're talking about you know early Cenozoic stuff rather than modern strictly Cenozoic, but um, just a quick. Uh, idea of what to expect from everything else. The saltwater crocodile is the largest reptile we have today. It's in the world. Um, basically, think of the crocodile in Lake Placid, you're thinking of a saltwater crocodile is the short answer. They grow to ridiculously huge sizes. Um, on average, they're four to five meters. The biggest ones possibly were seven. They live yeah. all around <laughs> Australia and Southeast Asia. They and the reason is because, as the name suggests, they can happily swim in salt water. They can swim off into the ocean. One was actually filmed catching a shark in the ocean and eating it. I think they dragged ashore. They um, they sleep on beaches, so the Coast Guard have to come along and kind of poke the bushes to make sure there's no saltwater crocodiles hiding. <laughs> if you look at a, I think it's named Brutus, um, there's oh, a photo right. of it. Jumbo size one jumping out of the water and grabbing a chicken. He only has one arm because another saltwater crocodile bit it. Oh, yeah, off. yeah. I know that famous photo. Yeah. Yeah, I know that one. Yeah, that's real. It's real. They grow that big easily. Um, so this kind of captures it. It's a crocodile that can live pretty much anywhere it likes. It also, it's not allergic to fresh water at all. They love fresh water. So that other movie where the the tourists escape from it by going across a freshwater stream and it becomes allergic to it, that doesn't happen. They can go anywhere they like. <laughs> um which is a good introduction for the next one. We can talk a bit about it, but I think there's not a huge amount of information called Quincana. Um, yeah. This is, yes, this is one that's been speculated to be terrestrial because its teeth, unlike a crocodile's teeth, which are just sharp, you know, pokey spikes to latch onto things and stick in, they're not able to process so much because they have to just sink into the prey and then they kind of slap it around to, break it apart. Although in the unique case of saltwater crocodiles, they're actually strong enough to actually sever things just by snapping down. So that's a bit of a difference. However, these ones, they have a very large skull or at least skull fragments that suggest they're about the same size as the largest saltwater crocodile. So about, you know, five to six or seven meters maybe, um, you know, as the largest size. Their teeth are sharp and cutting. So that raises some speculation that they were more terrestrial because they obviously couldn't count on the water to process their prey. They had to basically just chomp it up instead. And the idea of it being terrestrial isn't actually, is not silly at all. Our other crocodile can run on land. Um, the freshwater crocodile, which I might mention is actually a tiny little thing. It's, you know, about two meters long. So about the size of a large dog maybe, or as of a small human. Um, in terms of mass, they climb on land and they can gallop or not gallop, kind of lope like a cat does. They sprint with their yeah. front legs and they can move really fast on land. I don't know if they actually hunt on land. I'm sure they might catch something on land if they could, but they're still primarily water-based predators who like to be in the water. This potentially shows a, a crocodile that completely you know, allowed itself to hunt on land by sprinting around freely. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't get as much information on it. They have a relative, so they're called Mikosukids, I think. And there was one called Mikosukus, which for some reason they speculate was arboreal. I don't know how they, you know, know that. Maybe they have a proper skeleton of it, maybe not. But yeah, so this seems to be a potential family of crocod crocodilians that you know, some, at least some of the um, cases might have just, you know, lived out of water as, um, you know, and their general lifestyle. It seems like it's mainly teeth they keep finding about it. Okay, so I'm trying to, because this is a really fascinating animal. Like, there's a piece of art, um, Arson, I think I sent you it. I forget the artist, but this is the art that kind of introduced me to the concept of land cross. It was this animal chasing uh, tiny horses, and it just ate yeah. them. Like, there's one where it has it in its mouth, and it's mid-gallop. Oh, yeah, yeah, and um, 
it, this was my first introduction to what was known as the galloping croc. Yeah, that was a really like that piece. I was like, oh, this was a thing. <laughs> um, so like just so I can try to sort through the the main evidence for this animal being um, this galloping croc. Is it based on just tooth morphology or, or were the limbs longer that they can make those estimations? Do you know? I'm not sure. I think um, in terms of Mikosukin, um I think you um, probably could find relatives of it, and they seem to have um, some bones in question that could correlate to postcranial stuff. Yeah. Um, yep. I, yeah, actually, um, here's a possible place to start. Um, an article by, or a study by Michael Stein, Salisbury, Hand, and other researchers. Humeral morphology of the early Eocene Mecosuchian crocodilian Cambara from the Tingamara local fauna southeastern Queensland, Australia. So there are relatives, and luckily this one is not paywalled at all, and this one actually <laughs> shows x-ray scans of what appear to be limb bones of some sort. So that would be a very good place to piece it together because that would be a very close relative of this animal. And just to clarify as well, unlike other crocodilomorphian kind of animals where the, you know, there are a lot of terrestrial ones, but they were kind of diverged from any remotely modern crocodiles. These, I think, are actually part of the true crocodile family, or at least very closely related. So these would have actually evolved from your typical aquatic crocodiles. Oh, sorry, I can see it. The humerus, um, yes, they have images of the humerus of this particular animal so that you could actually piece Quincana together from this other animal. I should actually, um, yeah, I'm not sure if they actually say it by name, but yeah, I, I said the study. So um, that's, uh, yeah, so that's definitely somewhere to start. So. <laughs> Unfortunately, our reptiles of this era are a little bit piecemeal. Like, yeah. um, it's like with this one, and with probably one we could introduce next. Um, the Megalania is known from fragments, but lots and lots and lots and lots of fragments. We have enough to piece together what it is. Um, is there anything we want to say else about Kunkana and the um, Mechosuchines, or go straight to the big lizard? Well, here's the thing with um, galloping crocs. is like you said, we have crocs alive today that gallop across land. Mm -hmm. that, that's a thing. That's a thing that exists. Um, and they're just as they're just as happy on the land as they are on the water. Um, even some bigger, you no, know, like we get some of the largest. Uh, we have a species indicative in North America known as the alligator. Um, um, alligator Mississippiensis, I believe, is is the scientific name. And uh, we get some huge gators uh, in Florida because why not? Florida is crazy. <laughs> um, uh, and there's footage of a big alligator that was so shown just walking across a golf course because golf courses make for great, they're, they're almost a perfect environment for gators. They're, they're, they're the perfect area for them to travel from lake to lake. Um, they're the perfect environment for them to just sunbathe, uh, to sleep on, to nest on. When these guys made golf courses in an evergreen, uh, in the Everglades, in an Everglade dominant landmass, they kind of made a nirvana, a, a paradise for these large, giant <laughs> monstrous archosaurians. That's another thing you got to also highlight. Like, not most people know that. Birds and crocodiles are the only surviving members of Archosauria. Archosauria being the proper family that dinosaurs belong to, and pterosaurs. Mm -hmm. yep. So, uh, crocodiles are one of the last but big and flourishing families left behind from Archosauria. And not only do we see these large crocs and alligators that are huge, like they're huge, they're some of the biggest on record, happily crossing land like it's nothing because there's also a myth that the size of, a, of a, an animal can hinder it on land which sometimes it can there's been some large crocs that i've seen like the body mass gets to so big that they're just dominantly aquatic or or semi-aquatic 
Uh, but these huge alligators that we have are just ginormous, and they're just happily just like lumbering across golf course to golf course. Not at top speeds, but they're just like, like just do do do, do like no problem. <laughs> and then uh, we have Imagine we have into one like that. Just no. Like, no. <laughs> just, uh, like, uh, can we just play golf here, Mister Gator? You no, know? that that's a nope. true Jurassic Park moment where like you're just in your little golf course and trying to trying to drive away from a giant alligator at like 15 miles. <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, not only that, we have instances where these alligators are climbing fences. That That's another thing people don't know. They, they're, they're really good climbers. Um, and we're talking about a healthy fence. We're talking about like a five foot fence. This, this animal just got right over it. No problem. Just to get to the other side. <laughs> wow. So these animals alive today with very small limb proportions were able to do some crazy stuff versus an animal like uh, Quincana and, and its relatives with larger limb proportions. That's why I'm like, yes, there, there is an, there's more than substantial evidence these things were predominantly terrestrial. Uh, funny enough, he talked about uh, tooth morphology. Uh, there's a, there's a, there's a, Crocodile species, I believe, that has the same tooth morph morphology that's alive today. I think it's called the Cuban crocodile. Wow. And the Cuban crocodile actually doesn't have conical teeth. So conical teeth are usually indicative of a priscivore diet. Priscivore diet being fish or aquatic. Um, and that's conical teeth. That's where you get evidence of Spinosaurus being aquatic is because that's conical teeth. Same for Baryonyx and all these species. Crocodiles have conical teeth um, because they're semi-aquatic. The Cuban crocodile has actually these, these curved teeth, very similar to a T-Rex. Wow. So it's fascinating that you mentioned tooth morphology with Quincana because you can see those, those same tooth morphology in crocodilians alive today with the Cuban crocodile. So that's a very fascinating thing that I that I saw. I will bring up the picture once I find it of a Cuban croc just to illustrate the whole thing. So carry on, but I'm gonna definitely bring that up because it's a very very cool looking. Um, let's yeah. just say condition <laughs> there. It's worth showing. So give me a few seconds to dig it up. Yeah, and I'm not I'm not familiar with um, Cuban crocodiles. I'm not familiar with the ecological niche that they that they fit in. Uh, because tooth morphology and a lot of crocodilians are definitely like gharls have very thin teeth because they're they're mm. snapper fish. They're they're use they're built to catch uh, just freshwater fish that kind of flutter by. They they snap and they catch them in their teeth. Um, versus saltwater crocs have big teeth because they're they're taking down large prey items, even sharks. Uh, like you noted, um, same thing for crocodiles in Africa. They're taking down big mammals as they cross over rivers. Uh, during the migration period. Um, crocodiles are known to eat lions. Um, I think some of the deepest diving crocodiles you mentioned, um, I believe it was Steve Irwin. The few people realize that Steve Irwin was a practicing scientist. He wasn't just a, a TV personality. He was actually a practicing zoologist. And uh, yeah, you can see right there in those front teeth, they have that curvature that you see indicative of, of a T-Rex. And I can um, find a better picture, but I think some of them actually show even more curvature in and even bigger size of the teeth uh, among you know you know that middle bit. Yeah, uh, yeah. There are some I think that have even bigger and more uh, curvature on them as well. So if I find something, I'll post it here. Yeah, no, definitely. But yeah, you can see like tooth morphology in crocodiles um, is very wide ranging. Like even today, we have crocodile teeth that are, even within this crocodile, you can see very conical teeth for the back uh, that are almost mm. like pseudo mammalian. Like they're in the way of becoming like within a few million years, those those could be molar teeth. And then you got you got conical teeth, you got curved teeth, you got teeth in the front that are jutting out of the front. Like the crocodilians have a wide range of adaptations for teeth. I think Paul Sereno did a whole. Um, whole career on just the different tooth morphologies for crocodiles that were found in northern Africa and the Sahara Desert or the Sahara Sea and Morocco and all these places. Because then you get animals like 
capasuchus, which is the boar croc and, and the mouse croc, the pancake croc. <laughs> like, like these animals were just wide ranging in the, the areas they could adapt. So it's something that's interesting to note that it's alive. It's, it's well alive today in animals like quincana and land crocs and galloping crocs. Like they also have different tooth morphologies that kind of follow the same, the same niche. Uh, which is very fascinating because again one of the urban myths we hear about um not to go into a little side um side debate but one of the main tentpole arguments a lot of people make for teeth on theropods as far as being exposed to the elements or not was they needed to be hydrated or else the dentition would just start cracking and the enamel would dissipate uh but then we have land crocs which completely throw that out the water um, we have animals that were predominantly terrestrial. Their teeth are doing fine. They're they're not suffering from any major diseases. Even yeah. cro even crocodiles today, they go through a process called, I think, a, a civivation. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. Yeah, and they hibernate on land, and they're just out there exposed to the elements for almost months at a time, and their teeth are perfectly fine. And uh, yeah. also speaking of the big things that I was mentioning, these two, if you see the one highlighted on the right, and right below it, there is another one, so I can click between them. Look at those middle teeth as well. So look mm. at that, and then look at that as well. Yeah. So th 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 these are the kind of, these are the ones that demonstrate the size and curvature, maybe because they're more mature animals, perhaps, than the other one that I showed, but... Uh, yeah, if you, if you click on that photo, the green, the greener one, the one you just had. This one? Yeah, if you enlarge that photo, I don't know if it's possible, uh, but you can see the curvature of those teeth are pretty, pretty gnarly. It's like, that's... Because um, uh, um, I think it's part of the... Um, yeah, it's not possible here because uh, it's. Um, oh wait, so hold on, hold on. No, it's possible. Give me two seconds. <laughs> it's possible. Um, it's in fact uh, I was lucky because some of these sites they have these really small images that come up on Google in a very low res. Uh, this one, this is. Oh amazing. yeah, mm. that's cool. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, so you can see these animals are just very fascinating animals as far as their uh, their tooth morphology. And having this curvature to the teeth that that you just don't find on any other crocodilian really around today, uh, but you do find in the fossil record throughout the entire fossil record. Um, so that's very interesting to see that like Quincana, one of the because for the longest time I thought what defined Quincana as a land croc was the limb uh, the limb proportions. I thought it was the limb proportion. Um, it still might be. I said I have to check out this paper because he's so. You show that they note the humeral head or, or femur material, something of that nature. Oh, whole, whole humor, whole humerus. They actually okay. have, yeah, so and it looks pretty long and elongated. So I'd say, yeah, that's a probably a good place to start because that animal, by merely being a Mecosuchine in Australia, means it would be a very close relative of um, Quincana anyway. Oh, nice. anyone wondering <laughs> what the name of Quincana? Um, that's an Aboriginal name. I have no idea what it actually means, but um, you will get a lot of these as the name as names go out. You know, although others are just you know named um, by European names standards. So yeah, keep that in mind. <laughs> we like to pick a lot of Indigenous names of late. Um, sometimes we have alternate Indigenous names for animals. So and oh, and also FYI. Um, a few times we'll bring up dream time stuff because uh, I'd point out as in hum humans had uh, colonized Australia about 60,000 years ago at least. And at that time, a lot of these animals were actually still around back then and they actually did, had stories of a few of them or at least describing something very similar to them. Some even painted them and uh, in pa cave paintings. So, yeah, so that's something to keep in mind, but I'll get to that later. Um, very cool. I was other... really curious about. Oh, sorry, Josh. Okay, no, go ahead. Okay, oh, cool. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to, <laughs> I just wanted to point out how cool it would be if there were actually surviving dinosaurs all the way to maybe like uh, late medieval <laughs> or early Renaissance times, so even if they went extinct. Let's say you know before the first photographic technology appeared, we would actually have some really good paintings and fresque mosaics and stuff like that in different places <laughs> actually depicting them and we could actually know 
what sort of color variations they had and how they would have actually looked. Can you imagine how many potential debates that could have settled? I mean, it would have yeah. generated some as yeah. well, but <laughs> it would have settled a lot as well just because they would have written descriptions of them in the treatises. <laughs> just thought I'd point that out. <laughs> well, we actually do have, um, this is a segue for me, the uh, last aurochs actually went extinct in the 1600s. Um, well, the last Thunderbird went extinct about uh, maybe a century before that. Um, and the last mammoth went extinct about 3000 BC. So when the pyramids were being built, yeah, it was on a little island far north of Europe. But anyways, that's a yeah little side. So that kind of sort of did happen, <laughs> you know, and a lot of the animals yeah. that went extinct might have actually survived. Should we uh, mention a bit about the extinction event? Um, actually, or we could save it for the end. What do you reckon? Yeah, yeah. Now we can save it for the end because we want to end on a on a on a notable note. Um, but I will ask this real fast for these uh, for these Aboriginal uh, cave paintings because I, I I do a lot of research into that, and I know in Australia they have some of the oldest cave art around. Mm. I think it's been credited as. Um, do we get? descriptions of animals like Quincana or is Quincana or galloping crocs kind of extinct by the time we get these cave paintings? They were still alive um, at the time. And uh, I suppose I might as well do a quick cover of the extinction of the early extinction. Yeah. Um, so there was a long claim that the Aborigines actually wiped all the megafauna out because the megafauna seemed to have gone extinct at about that same time. However, as a very recent discovery, about 30,000 years old, so that's half, you know, half the distance before humans arrived, um, that actually found, finds an incredibly lush ecosystem that is full of all of these animals, including Quincana and all the, a lot of other ones we're going to list soon. And so that's, you know... That was humans were around for 30,000 years already, and this ecosystem was in full swing. And this actually disproved that the Aborigines killed all the megafauna because the, the megafauna are still clearly here and doing incredibly well. But they did find that it did um, correlate to the climate. Australia would, you know, toward was once a very lush place. At this period of time, things started to dry up a lot, and this was one of the last wetlands that we could find mm, before things gotcha. really bad. and that is actually what seems to have killed all the big megafauna and apparently as well it was even hard for the people who are living here to survive because there was almost no waterways left i think the you know human population dropped horribly from that as well and obviously this was enough to wipe out most other animals except ones that were suited for desert life which is pretty much what we have today um so yeah so we do have some art i can't i've tried to look into this as much as possible there's one possibly of a palakestes um one possibly of a marsupial lion um oh, wow. and uh yeah there's a bunch of other ones as well who can say what they are i haven't got much information <laughs> It. they seem to be a bit you know it's difficult to find that stuff but i did see the sketch of the marsupial lion myself so that's as much as i can really say but they did definitely do cave art of animals don't exist anymore that's really One cool way. yeah so, uh, quickly wanted to uh, read a question for harry before we continue um sorry josh that's the second time we are jumping in front of you <laughs> It's like, I, I'm not showing me some love. Yeah, wait, hold on a second, brother. You know I love you. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, um, I know love, baby. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Mr. Wilson, are you familiar with the... Uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but is it Boronjo or uh, Boronjor? I'm not sure. Uh, proper Bur uh, Boronjor? Boronjor. Uh, B-U-R-R-U-N-J-O-R. That sounds familiar. Yeah. So I guess the answer would probably be not really. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> well, that kind of answers it. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a question by Martin. So Martin, if you want to describe to us what that is, we might be, because it might be known by another name altogether. Um, 
or there might be a species closely related to this that we can then hone in on. But yeah, as far as I know, I think all of us are drawing a blank on that one. <laughs> yeah, I'm completely blank on it. Yeah, but no, it's definitely interesting though, the, the segue we got into cave art from land crocs, because like you said, I tell people, cave art is one of the earliest forms of paleo art. and It's probably how mm. you're going to get 99% accurate on all your, just like you use fossils versus internet trends, do your, cave, um, your paleo art. Yeah. That'll get you 99% there. <laughs> Go down to the modern day reinterpretations or like quote unquote enhanced, you know, modern day uh, sort of uh, ways of redoing the same art uh, from the cave paintings. You could say yeah. that cave art is basically the most accurate paleo art, uh, just yeah. full stop, pretty much. Yeah. And uh, it's like, um, yeah, there anything else that basically involves just straight up guesswork uh, on the same kind of level just it just doesn't work as much as the, the cave art even though the cave art would not be able to properly show off all the anatomy and muscle work and stuff like that because they just probably didn't have those kind of level of skills maybe to show it off properly without it looking somewhat i don't know impressionistic or cartoonish to a degree uh, yeah. but uh you know it's basically just what they were able to do it because they were able to see the animal so yeah what can you do? What else can you do to beat that, really, other than time travel? Yeah. yeah. And then uh, Martin actually clarified. Uh, so it's a cryptid. Uh, so I guess it's a it's a cryptid, right. a dinosaur that's alive in the outback. Uh, so I didn't know that. I know you guys had cryptids uh, as far as dinosaur cryptids. So I could say um, I haven't actually heard of the dinosaur cryptid. I'd say if it lives in the outback it's definitely no chance that it would be real because let's face it if literally everything besides super dupe 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 specialized desert animals were wiped out completely including most of the people you know about you know 60 to 20,000 years ago um there's no chance a dinosaur is going to live in the outback the outback is so <laughs> bone dry it's like imagine the arizona desert but it's a whole continent that's the outback yeah. That's like, we basically, our deserts, we have different deserts that are only named because they start looking a little different from the desert that's immediately next to it. They're like, <laughs> if you take Australia, um, let me think, which sides? Um, okay, so imagine, I'm not going to use my hands to illustrate because this is just going to confuse because I'm looking doing a mirror effect. Um, Australia is basically a giant desert with um, a tiny bit of coastline that's not desert. That's it. That is yeah. it. Tasmania, not a desert. Um, the rest of it, you know, the East Coast going in by, I don't know, 100 kilometers, maybe 200 in some areas, maybe 300. You know, it, Australia's about the same size as, you know, mainland USA. Um, if you were to basically imagine the easternmost states going up, you know, that, you know, they're the only parts that actually aren't desert in Australia. That's, that's pretty much it. So that's, yeah, they're not habitable. We do have other cryptids like Yowies, which are supposedly giant ape people. Um, the problem is how are apes going to get to Australia unless they happen to, you know, be humans who built a boat and sailed here, and then another bunch of humans built a boat and sailed here sixty thousand years afterwards. That's pretty much the only way that you know. Maybe it was, any maybe it was King Kong. I mean, he built an axe. He built a magic axe. Maybe he built a. Oh, boat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, you know, maybe he sailed the axe over. Or maybe he was so big he just crossed over, you know, on foot. Oh, that's another thing as well. There's a bit of confusion about the so-called land bridge in Australia, and I think this is probably a good um, introduction for it. At the time, in the Cenozoic, um, instead of being basically a giant massive inland seas and a few islands or a few weird peninsulas, you know, that are mostly flooded, Australia, um, the ocean levels dropped. Australia, for some reason, didn't become a desert, but actually became a very large, lush supercontinent that was joined with New Guinea um, or Papua. Um, I think it's probably better to call it Papua because the whole place is called Papua and the other parts called New Guinea. But anyway, Papua, yeah. Australia, joined by land, nothing really dividing them. It was just one continuous place and I think Tasmania was joined as well New Zealand was not New Zealand's far far away from Australia it's like the literal size of Australia ocean that same mass and maybe a bit more and then you get New Zealand um but 
despite being this giant continent, it was still not actually connected to Eurasia. The close, it was pretty close at this point because Sulawesi and actually the whole Indonesian Malay archipelago was also a singular giant supercontinent. Um, also the names, Australia, New Guinea was called Sahul and the whole Southeast Asia, you know, archipelago turned singular dry continent is Sunda. And those two got pretty close together. Um, you know, so Papua and <laughs> Sulawesi were like, you know, you could probably, you know, stand on one and actually see the landmass of the other, but you would have still had to sail there. And that's probably how the um, indigenous, all the indigenous populations got to where they were in Australia today, because the ancestors probably lived there, saw that and sailed across, probably bought the whistling dogs with them. That's why we have dingoes today, because they're basically a member of the whistling dog family, which is a subspecies of wolf. Yeah. But yeah. So that's pretty much, so that probably captures, um, Australia was a different place. It was actually connected to um, New Guinea. And that's why there's marsupials there today. And a lot of animals crossing over both of those places because they were both one point. I think Tasmania was a little more isolated um, because there's some really unique and weird animals that we probably won't get much time to talk about. Like they had pretty much, I wouldn't say a marsupial orangutan, but they had a marsupial that wasn't a koala, but it was like big, had long arms and climbed trees. And it was about man-sized and a bunch of other weird stuff as well, um, which we'll probably get into later. Um, but I think, where should we start next? Should we go to... Maybe, maybe finish with yeah, the reptiles and then just <laughs> move on. <laughs> this is the one everybody knows. <laughs> yeah. So. Let's, let's, uh, let's share this. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Where is it? There it is. So, yeah. It's Megalania. 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 Yep. Um, I think Prisca, because I'm pretty sure it's named after Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, I think, is a movie with famous movie about hugo weaving where dressing up and um a bit small i think actually let's go back to the bigger there we are so this would be a pretty accurate size i have seen skull fragments that suggest an animal roughly this size and proportions and and yeah i tell you what roman really does his research because i read a study that suggested that you know the bigger a monitor lizard gets the larger its limbs get in proportion to the rest of the body and the more muscular they get. And I should point out that Megalania is indeed a monitor lizard. It's closely related to the Komodo dragon and to the Goannas and Parentes that we have today. And they still grow pretty large. They're like two meters long, a little bit more. Um, and it's got extensive teeth remains. It's got extensive, you know, bits of skull, bits of bone, you know, leg bones, backbones, ribs, tail. So, Overall, across all the individuals, we pretty much get a complete skeleton because they're usually fragments from lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of different individuals. There's still a bit of speculation on how exactly it's proportioned. So this is pretty much why we kind of know so much about it, yet there's still so much debate about it going on right now, if anyone's wondering. And yeah, how this much, like um, for Megalania, how much of the skeleton do we have? Because I know we don't have a complete skull, right? It's mainly jaw fragments. Yep. I think putting it all together, you probably could get between all the skull fragments we have, more or less complete skull. And at the very least, we have enough to kind of know the rough proportions and how big the skull is. And it's pretty much as Roman depicted it is the biggest skull size. I did see a display in. Melbourne Museum that shows probably a composite showing how big they could probably get. So it's a bit scarce, but it's enough that the composite's probably fairly accurate and it would show an animal roughly that size. Okay, cool. So uh, there is something in the chat. Um, uh, maybe it's a good idea to address the whole point about monitors being uh, venomous, uh, just to clarify mm. a few things. So could we go over that again, please, if you don't mind? Okay. So <laughs> I can do this one. I've studied a bit about this. So what venom is is basically your mouth enzymes just becoming more potent. So right now, if you were to bite another person, 
that person's injuries would actually potentially get infected or have difficulty healing because all the saliva and the enzymes in your mouth actually combat that, among other things, as well as di starting to digest food. With a monitor lizard, um, okay, so the extreme other end is a snake venom. It's still mouth enzymes. They're just so hyperpotent that they themselves can actually start causing toxicity in the blood and really causing a huge amount of damage. Monitor lizards, which, you know, are probably, I'd say actually close to the ancestors of snakes in terms of roughly where they're related. There's, I think there's still a bit of debate about where exactly that happens, but in terms of ancestor of snakes, monitor lizards, they're about as probably close as existing animals can get. Monitor lizards are the beginning of true venom. It's so weak, though, that people actually insist that calling it venom is irresponsible. However, the enzyme, the toxicity of a monitor lizard is actually enough to be slightly poisonous and it does completely prevent healing of a wound. It just constantly causes more and more bleeding and prevents healing. So there is actually a level of toxicity in ordinary monitor lizard venom that inhibits healing. However, it's not actually enough to actually kill you. Like if you somehow manage to patch up the wounds, you'll be completely fine. And a lot of people get bitten by them all the time and they're fine. Some people get their fingers bitten off by them, so they're not quite as fine, but they're obviously alive afterwards because they told the story. Um, but it's weak venom. It is incredibly weak. It's borderline not venom at all, and a lot of people suggest that's the way it is. With Komodo dragons, they have that toxicity in their saliva, but they also have a lot of rotting stuff and other bacteria and all this nasty cocktail of extra chemicals from all the rotting food that gets stuck in their teeth adding to that and actually making it poisonous for their prey. So even though it's not the venom strictly doing it, they do have some natural toxicity in their saliva that does cause damage to a body. It's just not particularly substantial. So you could very safely say that Megalania would have that, but you can guarantee that it, uh, one bite's not going to kill anything. It's probably not even going to make it sick. It's just... It's just a basically very potent saliva that prevents healing. They probably would have that because monitor lizards have that as well. Yeah. I, so, if, uh, Josh. Okay. Yeah. No, to break it down further, so like when people talk about venom, there's two specific types of venom normally associated with snakes and insects. Uh, it's broken down into two classes. So there's neurotoxin, and then there's hematoxin. Neurotoxin attacks the nervous system. So that's what you get inside something like a cobra or a viper. Um, hematoxin actually breaks down the tissue. It actually physically breaks. It's almost like a pre-digestive that gets injected and it, and it pre-liquidates the muscle tissue in a prey item. Uh, I know this because I used to handle rattlesnakes and I saw a lot of rattlesnake uh, bites and it is definitely not something you want to see. Um, Varanids, specifically the Komodo dragon, because I don't know about any um, studies that were done into other Varanids, but I know specifically the Komodo dragon because Komodo dragons do a, a weird behavior that right before they tackle a large prey item, they start pre-salivating. So their saliva glands go into hyperdrive. And that's when you know a Komodo dragon is looking at you thinking of lunch because it actually starts salivating and you'll see it dripping from his jaw. And for the longest time, people didn't know, like, why are the Komodo dragons pre-salivating before they're even attacking a prey item? And what they found out was they originally thought that Komodo dragons were using the uh, rancid uh, bacteria from carrion, because they're also carrion. They also eat the dead. Uh, in fact, there were cases of Komodo dragons digging up bodies of indigenous people in the Komodo Islands. So they were eating the corpses of people. That's how they know that they were, they were eating, they were carrion, true carrion eaters. Um, so they thought for the longest time that that was inflicting the infectious bites on prey items, notably water buffalo. And then they started studying the saliva and then they found out that there's actually, like you said, Harry, there's an anticoagulant in the saliva of Komodo dragons. 
and then it, and it does exactly what Harry describes. Basically, Komodo dragons they bite it a, a prey item, they give it a vicious wound, and then they back off, and then they'll stalk it for miles until the item, the prey item dies from loss of blood or becomes weak enough to the, where they could just start feeding on it. And um, so that's, that's roughly the breakdown of what type of venom is in a Komodo dragon. It's a very subdued form of hematoxin, I think, but it's doing the same purpose. It's, it's causing the cells to break down. It's causing it to where you won't be, like you if you get a cut and you and you scab that's your blood coagulating to form that scab if a komodo dragon does that your your wound doesn't heal it just stays open and you just keep bleeding out uh so it, it, it's definitely a very vicious way to die <laughs> um, and it definitely shows how uh, inventive these granids were for taking down large prey items mm. uh, when it comes to megalania i mean the thing was so big it's like, it, it, I, I wouldn't doubt that it had this kind of additional piece of armory in, in, its, yeah. in its hunting methods to take down large prey. But at the same time, it's, it's also an animal that wouldn't even really need it uh, because it was so huge. Like whatever it got close enough to bite, it would just be able to just eviscerate that thing just, with, just by shaking its head. Because uh, yeah. that's another way Vranids eat is they, they hold a prey item and they just shake it because they're trying to rip off limbs mm. or pieces of meat. Uh, so if you can imagine a Megalania, Megalania gra grabbing something like a wombat, which isn't that big, and just shaking it to death, that'll do the job. <laughs> like, yeah. like, a comparison between the human figure and the Megalania and look at the Megalania's head and uh, uh, you can easily see that this thing could not just tear off limbs or a tear off the head, but it would just be able to actually tear off the entire torso and detach it from its from the human's legs quite easily. Yeah. Just based on this uh, image alone, you can say, provided that it's basically accurate and I trust Roman uh, to be able to correctly observe the scaling here as well yeah. of the images, both of the human and uh, I actually wonder if the human is a model or if it's himself actually, <laughs> so I'm curious for that. <laughs> Because I know that sometimes people, you know, very casually self-insert, but just like without making it too obvious, unless you know for sure. So because we don't care about that a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, this thing would just tear you, um, tear you. You know, I was gonna say a new one, but there would be nothing left to tear a new one on. Um, <laughs> the thing about um, snake if you can uh, also maybe clarify a little bit as well is that uh, you know how uh, all the venomous snakes uh, and we're talking exclusively venomous snakes um, mm -hmm. uh, that they seem to have specific venom glands as well mm. that they use to inject it's like a syringe sort of principle that they use so that's not exactly that their saliva is as such but does it still kind of work on the same principle as saliva generation uh, like from a thing but it just uses a specific adapted mechanism to inject it when they bite. Apparently, um, um, go ahead, Harry. I do know a bit that um, apparently they don't survive without the venom glands. Apparently, they are important for helping digest their prey or to instigate the digestive process. So that could still be true. Yeah, it's it's kind of like the difference uh, because again, snakes are so highly specialized in what they do. Uh, it's the difference between getting an antibacteria and injecting it with a syringe, or just getting that antibacteria and just smearing it on a tooth and just stabbing your subject. Um, those are the two big differences <laughs> between uh, snakes with highly adaptive venom injection method than varanids uh specifically the komodo dragon and how it chooses it like komodo dragons have a very primitive very very primitive form of in in introducing those foreign bodies into their prey subjects um because i think shy of pythons which are not venomous no most snakes do that that bite and retract method for taking down larger prey items. Um, and with dragons, with Komodo dragons, they, they roughly, like, they are pursuit predators. They will chase you up trees. Um, 
like they're they're not shy about chasing down people actively chasing down people for the purpose of eating them yep so it, it's one of those things where it's like it's it's kind of similar but it's not like even some lizards i think the only other lizard species that's venomous is the gila monster and even the gila monster shows an injection method of venom that's closer to snakes than varanids because gila monsters have their venom in the jaw funny enough not on the mm -hmm. not on the skull but in the jaw and the wow. teeth that come up from the Gila monster, those are actually hollow to inject the venom into their prey eye. So Gila monsters are funny enough following the snake diagram for venom injection more than Varanids. Uh, to, so like, even though Harry did make a point where like in the family tree, cladistically, they are very similar. Uh, they're so similar that there was debate for years about the origin of Mosasaurus. Mosasaurus was debated like, was it the same lineage that gave birth to snakes or was it the same lineage that gave birth to, to monitor lizards? Uh, they finally found a fossil of a Mosasaur with the, with the trachea in uh, at the Natural History Museum. We have that fossil well preserved. So that kind of settled the debate like, okay, they were, they were evolved from the same family that gave birth to Varanids that kind of settled that debate but that kind of shows you how similar the body plan is shy of a few things that were tweaked here and there in the family tree uh but we don't have cases of varanids showcasing the same venom injection methods that we do with very highly evolved venomous snakes like vipers and cobras those are very highly evolved venom injection methods versus varanids i i, I would even debate that komodo dragons had developed this anticoagulant uh, as a secondary method. So it's something that they didn't inherit because of their relations to snakes. I'd say that was something they evolved again down the road. Uh, Cause I think the Komodo dragon is one of the more, I don't know if it's one of the more advanced Varanids. I know it's one of the largest Varanids, but in the, in, in the family tree of Varanids, I don't know if it's the most advanced. Um, but it's definitely not the most primitive Varana that we have out there. Um, so it might fall right in the middle, um, but it's definitely like, it's, it's, it's similar, but it's not, it's like, it's very night and day in terms of like the venom injection methods that we're seeing with lizards or not even all lizards. Like I said, the Gila monster, uh, but what we're seeing with Varanids versus what we're seeing with snakes. Those are two very separate venom injection methods. I was very two separate schematics. Like it's, like I said, it's the difference between a syringe and, and just a blunt force object that you're stabbing <laughs> to administer medicine to. It doesn't work, but Miranda's <laughs> are still doing it. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, uh, th this is another thing I wanted to uh, address as well. Is that it's quite interesting to note uh, how. Uh, the venomous snakes, um, they uh, seem to utilize their venom at its fuller, but let's just say in comparison. At, and so that's what I've heard from, you know, just people who generally study venomous snakes or even have experience keeping and handling them, is that they seem to uh, prefer to inject more venom into their prey instead of, let's say, like a human or something else that is attacking them because they prefer escaping over, you know, uh, actually full-on injecting all their venom because their venom is like their hunting resource. It's like if they are starving, if they're hunting and then you happen to disturb it and it wastes all venom, venom on you, it's almost like it might potentially risk, you know, uh, losing a few kilos, if you want to put it that way, <laughs> by starving before it can actually regenerate enough venom to kill its potential prey. So that, that's what I heard anyway, that even some of the potent um, venomous uh, snakes may not always inject uh, the venom. Yeah, no, it's funny you mentioned that because um, I've got, no. yeah, I've, yeah, no, because I, I, I've, um, I've had to relocate venomous snakes at work of all things. I used to work in Malibu and um, it's right, it's right in front of a wildlife preserve. And oh, yeah. uh, I had to, rem I had to remove baby rattlesnakes and we even talk to people like baby rattlesnakes are actually more venomous not in terms of more venomous but they're more dangerous than their adults because here's how highly evolved venomous snakes are and it's weird that we're talking about this while talking about megalania <laughs> so yeah. after this we'll, we'll jump back into megalania um yeah. but the the 
the advancedness of of rattlesnakes, for example, maybe rattlesnakes have to learn how much about how much venom they inject. It's a muscle memory. It's something they got to train. Their, it's like a deer learning how to walk. Baby rattlesnakes have to learn how much venom to inject because when they're younger, they have they do it on a reflex and they actually inject more venom because it's a reflex than adult rattlesnakes because they've learned how to control the amount of venom they inject. So it's very interesting. Like it's not it's not a reflex mechanic. It's not like a certain milliliter of venom that's allocated to every bite that they do that's just automatically done that's a muscle memory that's something they got to memorize and train themselves to do like we got to memorize we only inject so many cc's of venom every bite versus when they're younger they're just like inject all the venom like you know? <laughs> but it's fascinating because not not too many people know that people think about venom and they think about it as as a reflex action when it's actually something that is a muscle memory it's it's a physical action of a muscle that they have to learn to do before they get to adulthood. So they, because exactly that, venom is a resource that has to be regenerated. It's not like, they're not constantly at a full tank. So it's, they, it's like to, basically a spam the venom button. <laughs> yeah, spam the venom. Yeah, that's what the baby rattlesnakes are doing. They're spamming the, the venom button and the, the adults are like, nope, we only have to hit the button once and then we just let it do what it needs to do. <laughs> so... All right, but sorry it's very for divergence, uh, but uh, I mean, obviously, thanks for more input because it's very nice to hear from people who have experience, you know, with hands-on approach. But uh, in any case, uh, shall we get back to Megalania and then we'll do the third reptile and we'll get into the main juice parts after that. Main juice. <laughs> the juice. <laughs> the juice. <laughs> All right, let's do it. Um, I think overall Megalania... Um, I'd say, you know, it's clearly the apex predator of Australia during the Cenozoic. Um, it is clearly, um, probably along with Quincana, it, they're equal largest animals. And it's curious that they're both reptiles. That probably, you know, maybe because they need to eat less, they can afford to grow bigger. But, yeah, they are both the largest predatory animals that appeared, to have, that appeared in Australia by a massive margin. They... Um, they were both larger than the saltwater crocodile by a little bit, and um, and they actually coexisted with it for quite a while. So that's actually a bit of an interesting thing about their niches. But otherwise, I don't think there's anything left I can think about um, Megalania in itself. Um, I've heard of the animal. Hmm? I was going to ask you, do you think Megalania was coexisting with uh, Quincana and... Yep. Because it, it kind of filled the, the dominant terrestrial uh, predator niche. Do you think that might have... Because I, I want to say Megalania outlived Quincana, right? Like, Megalania was around a lot longer than Quincana was. So do you think yeah. that might have forced it out of the terrestrial niche and that what kind of forced crocs back into the wetlands? I think it's... I think Quincana is probably a really weird niche. Um, Megalania seemed to have spread over a much wider area. So I would suspect that, um, you know, potentially, like, I guess as well, when you think about a lizard, you know, like, they thrive in deserts. They thrive in dry lands. They don't need much water. Um, they don't... Um, they can last for a long time without eating anything. They only really have to... Um, they can dig up literally anything they want. And that could be a big advantage of Megalania is it probably was just able to dig things up. And as a result, it could just get more access to more prey than the crocodile could. Because even if the crocodile could chase things on land, it's probably strictly limited to animals that could chase um, animals that were slower than itself, which were plenty of at the time. Ones that couldn't burrow probably ones that still, maybe it still had an instinct that it sort of stayed near waterways to, catch animals that needed to go drinking, but obviously could just chase them straight out or chase them into the water. And perhaps, well, a Megalania could just, if it found something to eat, it could just get it. It was as simple as that. It could either chase <laughs> it for a bit, lacerate it, you know, maybe grab it and thrash it. Um, Guanas do that today. Or it could have found a burrow of something, whatever, and just dug into it, stuck its head in, you know, crushed its skull or pulled it out and, 
you know, did what it wanted with it because modern goannas and princes do that. In fact, we, Australia is suffering a giant feral animal problem. They're, you know, displacing native animals left, right and centre. They're, you know, wiping things out. They're even eating them. The goannas are having the exact opposite effect from this. They're actually thriving because the feral animals in question are rats, cats, rabbits, perfect size to, for these animals to eat. They're not <laughs> threatened by them. They eat them. They're extra big. They're not used to having animals of these particular sizes, but they're the perfect size for these things to eat. And nowadays, goannas prey on rabbits now. They... That's their favorite food. Forget native animals. They just love to find rabbit burrows and they just dig them up and maul them to death. So <laughs> in this case, it shows. Yeah. <laughs> it's, just, it's, it's just, a, and also they're not really afraid of dogs either. Even though dingoes are like twice the size of the biggest, go and actually no, they're not. They're about the same size as the biggest goannas. They're twice the size of most goannas. They're not really threatened by them because they can just bite them really hard and just draw blood and rip tissue open. So they're not threatened. They're not um, by other predators as easily. They're very adaptable. They can adjust to all kinds of changes to the environment and normally invasive species. They're just more food options. So overall, I think Megalania's advantages is just much more versatile than Quincana was because Quincana fossils aren't as sparse. Well, Megalania, I'm pretty sure, are finding all over the continent. So I think it's as simple as that. I wanted to propose a theory uh, for you guys to examine a little bit as well, uh, that uh, since they still actually coexisted at a certain point anyway, before one outlived the other, obviously, uh, it's very interesting to note uh, the tale of uh, Varanids and what it was capable of. And, the Meg and Megalania may not have been an exception and here is what I was going to propose. Um, Queen Kana being a crocodilian, it would have armor, which means that it would practically be invulnerable to the bites of lizards like Megalania, because Megalania yeah. relies on fighting unarmored prey. Uh, and um, this means that if Megalania and Queen Kana ever came across one another, provided they're both at their real, respectively similar or full adult sizes, so it means you know they directly can compete and stand toe to toe. Maybe Megalania used the tail whip to potentially scare off uh, Quincana to prevent itself from being you know eaten and uh, potentially killed by uh, the crocodile. So, uh, what, do what do you think of that? I think it would definitely not be prey to the Quincana, but I have a feeling that in terms of an actual encounter, I reckon the Quincana would probably have its way because. It's armored, it probably has much more bite force in its jaws. <clears throat> and But I think the simple fact is Quincana clearly relied on a much more specific niche. Megalania could thrive wherever it felt like. So I think it's a simple fact that probably the ironic um, part is me even though Megalania might not have been strictly the, <clears throat> the nastiest, most ferocious of the reptiles in terms of confrontation, it probably could just thrive literally anywhere else while Quincana was probably more boxed into a specialist niche. It's as it just seems, just judging from, you know, modern crocodiles, modern monitors, you know, the distribution of fossils. Um, so that's my guess. It seems I that all the more specialized ones seem to be the ones that are the first uh, so-called so victims of the extinctions that go, just like we see in Spinosaurids as another example. They're highly specialized and thus they tend to suffer from that sort of uh, repetitive, in fact, consistent pattern in any yep. kind of case where you have something that is very specialized in something and uh, whenever something changes, if you look at also oh, another example, and it's a side note example, but just to demonstrate uh, Titanoboa and uh, Purosaurus, huge animals, but also very specialized in terms of what they were doing and how they were adapted to live. So once those things, the conditions that were needed for them to exist, start disappearing, well, they kind of follow shortly after. So I guess Megalania is the classic example of something that is very versatile and adaptive, which is why it's successful, probably. You know, more successful, maybe, than Quincana in terms of, you know, how it outlived it. So well, quick well, there's, mm -hmm. there's something you noted really fast, Harry, uh, that I wanted to backtrack on. So you noted that Goanas are doing very well in Australia because they're introduced species that 
ironically make a great food item. <laughs> so, and it's it's funny because we're saying the we're seeing the same kind of thing with Komodo dragons. Funny enough, because water by I I believe water buffalo and feral pigs aren't mm -hmm. native to the Komodo Islands. They're not. No. no. But they make great food items, and now Komodo dragons are thriving. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so it's kind of a like it's kind of that that scenario that you guys have in Australia, but blown up to eleven D on the Komodo Islands. So much so that um Arson, I sent you a piece of art. It was a this was a doodle um that I did of a Megalania. But there's something in this doodle I do want to point out real fast. Um if you could find that and throw that up. But with the Komodo dragons, because they're now having access to very large prey items, they're doing something weird with their jowls. Like their their mouths are kind of getting very jowly now because they're just creating such accesses of saliva to take down these large creatures like water buffalo that I think I've even seen, okay, so right here, so you can see in this sketch, like these, I'm making these hyper large jowls with a lot of envenomation. Um, this was from a study I did just from Komodo dragons that are currently hunting, hunting on a, a water buffalo today. And um, it's very strange to see because I, I think I've even seen Varanids with they're starting to have exposed dentiary because the, their mouths are just becoming so hyper adaptive to taking down these large prey items like they're actually I've seen a few photos. I've been trying to find them online, but there's a lot of Komodo dragon images If, if I want to reach out to our community if you want to hunt down those photos because I'm still looking for them, but I've seen a lot of this stuff where there's like the the varanids are even growing to a size that there's a there's a cryptid funny enough called the Sumatran dragon and it's based off of shoreline footage where they see these dragons that are growing to such huge sizes that there is one piece of footage I saw and it's a real video that's out there I haven't been able to find it again but it was on the discovery channel of all things uh, before the discovery channel got kind of crazy <laughs> um, so this was like back in the early 90s of the Discovery Channel, not today, where it's like Buffalo, uh, Bigfoot Hunter and all that nonsense. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, they they showed this footage of this these people on this boat driving through the Sumatran Islands and the, right there on the on the shoreline of the um, of the hills. There was just a giant varanid just chilling there. And it. It, it was definitely an a Komodo dragon, but the thing was growing was so large that people were like, maybe this is a new cryptid species. Maybe this is the Sumatran dragon. I don't know. Uh, because these things were getting so big and because these teeth were so hyper adaptive for large prey items. And that's the thing that's interesting to note with Megalania because we have the jaw bits, but we have these giant teeth. This was an animal that was indeed taking down large prey items because we've shown that Komodo dragons are doing it today with animals that are like twice, twice the animal size. Like a water buffalo is no small joke. It's a big animal, uh, but it only takes one or two bites from a Komodo dragon to take one down. Uh, same thing for feral pigs. Pigs that are feral can get very vicious and are known to lacerate people out in the wild with their tusks. So the fact that a Komodo dragon could take one down, no problem, and even swim to the other islands and keep hunting on the island chain. It's very interesting to note that this is something Megalania may or may not have done. Like like you said, when by the time we have Megalania alive, the islands have kind of broken apart to their separate niches. And we might have had cases where we might find Megalania. I don't think we have. I think it's still isolated to Australia, but we might in the future be able to find traces of at least Megalania that were venturing out to these other island chains. Um, I would love to see if there's possibly a way to do a DNA comparison, because we did it recently with dire wolves, uh, which caused a huge upset recently uh, with their lineage. Mm. If we can find uh, megalania material that we can pull DNA isotopes from. I'd be very interested to see if we could do a DNA comparison to oh, Komodo yeah. Dragon and Megalania to see if that linea is connected at some point. Well, I think we do know that um, 
The modern goanna is really closely related to the Komodo dragon. So we've actually got a, quite a bit of the puzzle already is that these two lizards became isolated, but they're the closest related varanids of any other varanid in the world. So they're almost, they're from the same immediate family. So, so really the differences would be, be very mild. It would be interesting to see if they were closer to the Komodos or to mainland Goannas. So that would actually pretty much be what it would come down to. They're already incredibly close related. So it would be like, I suppose it's like dire wolves and actual wolves in the sense that this whole, you know, discovery of these two animals, keep in mind for anyone uh, watching this, Jackals are so closely related to wolves. They're from the same immediate family. They share it with cape hunting dogs and stuff as well. But, you know, to basically move from wolf to jackal is like moving from one type of fox to another type of fox or, and in the case, yeah. So it's like, or, you know, basically two very closely related, almost related animals. It turns out to be from the other related animal rather than the actual animal itself. So, that would probably be how close they are. So the lineage would be close no matter what it actually turns out to be. Very cool. Right. So are we good with the Megalania or uh, do we want to move on to the last reptile, the big turtle, and uh, then move into marsupial evolution? Yep. Yeah, a uh, quick shout out by Ryan. Uh, he said, OMG, nice start. Thanks, Ryan. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Um, Okay, so yeah, so I think the last thing, uh, as far as the reptiles are concerned, we have this this giant's armored turtle. Like the thing looks like King Koopa. <laughs> yeah, it does. It looks like King Koopa. <laughs> I'm just still getting my head around this animal. So, just, I had a look at the skeleton um, when I was like, I only learned about this animal when Arson told me about it, and I'm like, what? Um, so, <laughs> We have apparently a giant, strange proto turtle that um, it has an actual dome shaped shell. So it's not like a true turtle in the sense like the ones today, which are like we have ocean turtles and we have freshwater turtles, and the freshwater turtles have sleek, slim, streamlined shells so they can move really fast in the water. And they also have actually big, strong arms with webbed feet, then they can actually move really fast on land too. And I know this because I used to try and catch them as a kid. Um, <laughs> but yeah, they're all carnivorous. This, well, at least the freshwater ones are very carnivorous. These apparently were true herbivores. They lived in pretty much alongside all these other animals. Interestingly, if you look at the tail, the, um, the skeleton of the tail, the end vertebrae actually suddenly get bigger and thicker and wider and more rigid so it probably had some kind of clubbing ability and uh and yeah so it was a strange herbivorous jumbo sized turtle like part of that family and yeah it looks much... like it, yeah it looks like a turtle that was trying to be an ankylosaurus to be honest with you <laughs> mm. could have well been actually that could have been well... really... I was thinking that the, tur the the turtle's tail could also have been used uh, as an extra utility tool, maybe to, you know, dig uh, a little bit in the sand and just like spread it over or maybe like put, um, if it mm. just dug something, like say if it had to uh, dig up a, a hole, then maybe, you, I don't know, bury something like, a, I don't know, some turtles, do they bury their eggs when they lay them on the shores or do they not? They do. Yeah. Very slightly. They lay their eggs in very shallow holes and then they just bury them over with like maybe an inch of sand or less. So other animals yeah. can't see them. But, you know, if they when the babies hatch out, they literally just stick their heads out and they're pretty much already poked out of the... Right. So it's not egg. much then, yeah. Yeah, so they would probably do that. Yeah, so it's like, say, if you put too much, um, uh, you know, dirt or soil, whatever, on top of the eggs, it would just use the tail to spread it even, to make it thinner, and just overall even out the ground to allow that kind of distance, which could also be another potential study of a case of whether or not they were, um, you know, capable of uh, doing some kind of, you know, uh, displaying some kind of motor, what do you call that, you know, the muscle memory of how to judge and gauge the... Mm. 
level and leverage of how they should do it before they get it right. Because I'm pretty sure first couple of times they would have gotten it wrong and a lot of babies would just not survive and suffocate <laughs> or not. Who knows? So it's just, an, just a proposal for a theory uh, for the viewers as well. Well, it, it's interesting to note because Martin, uh, Martin's been our superstar in this chat. Is this guy's been dropping mad factoids? So a shout out to Martin. Uh, but he said that it, it convergently evolved with Ankylosaurus, which is nuts, because uh, I believe this is part of a lineage of these specific turtles that do date back to the Mesozoic. But the thing about this species is that it is still alive. Uh, I, if I'm reading the notes here correct, from the middle Miocene to the late Pliocene, possibly even the Holocene, uh, which I believe for those of you guys who don't know, the Holocene is like, I believe that's now, like we live in the Holocene. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this is very much an interesting note of like, just like crocodilians are noted as living fossils, not because they're primitive, we've seen how, how much they, they can adapt and how diverse they are, but because they date back so far. Uh, this mm. is another case where it's uh, myelania. It dates back almost as far as that lineage to the Mesozoic. And because Australia is just uh, very well known for being a pocket ecosystem and a haven for animals that died out in earlier uh, earlier times, like Kulasukas, for example, um, it's a Permian animal that lived all the way to Cretaceous. Myelania is a Mesozoic animal that lived all the way to the Holocene. So this is, definitely, this is definitely, yeah. So this is definitely an animal that like was thriving with the environmental changes because late Pleistocene to Holocene, that's roughly when the the continent became more arid and desert like, and this animal obviously was able to adapt more than fine. It was like, yeah, I'm a turtle. Desert tortoises exist, you know. Turtles are well mm -hmm. are well recorded throughout all kinds of deserts. So this is definitely an animal that would have been at home in a wide range of environments. It's it's very, uh, well, first of all, yes, that's 100% correct. They were very adaptable. Uh, one thing that I wanted to, you know, introduce, when we say that, you know, they're relatives and stuff like that, we mean uh, not uh, narrowed families, but the super families, because uh, Kulasukas and its family are still uh, like a sister, maybe sort of ish group uh, to the uh, Prionosuchus. But they would be probably from the same super family, uh, yeah. same way as like Proceratosauridae. They are, you know, uh, part of Tyrannosauroidea, just like Tyrannosauridae. They are part of Tyrannosauroidea, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And the same thing with Myo, um, uh, Myolani. They, uh, they, those themselves were around from about Miocene, mid Miocene probably, but their super family would have been around uh, much longer than that. So I yeah. want to point yeah. out that when we talk about relat relatives in this context, the context is not from the immediate family, but from the super family, just so that people, uh, you know, understand the new ones. Other than that, uh, I, I think that's pretty much spot on. Yeah. Yeah. We're not talking about myelania specifically, but there are, that's the weird thing about turtles. Turtles, um, they copy each other's homework a lot. <laughs> um, so you get turtles that are actually even today you get turtles that are classified within the family of specific turtle and then later on after more research it's like oh we can't really we can't really depend on the cosmetics with turtles because turtles just start mimicking each other so closely that they got to get a little more, a bit more deeper into how they're classified uh, but no this is definitely a wild wild turtle it's one of the larger ones i think this is the is this the largest species of this family specifically i think so and uh, the the weirdest part is uh, i don't know about of course uh, which i'm just guessing that roman here depicted the largest uh, species uh, because uh, you know why would you not right so <laughs> but um, <laughs> But th there is okay. one interesting thing uh, that uh, the largest species, I think, has not actually been named. It's just, it's still labeled as SP dot. Wow. Oh wow! Cool. <laughs> so this, this is the odd one about it that they haven't actually named the species, but it is probably the depiction of the largest species. And uh, to be fair, there are a few differences between some of them. For example, the way the horns are oriented, some of them point more forward. Uh, this one, as you can see, points backwards. And uh, I think in some cases, the size and thickness of these uh, cresty horns 
also were different because there are multiple you know species and some of them are just sister taxa of the melania presumably that that's what it is because uh, i don't know how numerous the specimens are either that would dictate a lot the reliability of the, them being established as each other's uh, closest genera or whether or not they might just have all been uh, the, the same taxon of you know perhaps uh, just uh, different species which uh, i honestly just have no clue about i'm just kind of poking it a little bit <laughs> no definitely so i think we're roughly um i think we're already two hours in with this session funny enough it doesn't I'm feel happy like to go on for as long as it takes to be honest so feel free if yeah. you want to move on we can move on now uh, definitely, but for the uh, for uh, everybody's sanity, uh, maybe we just power through these main couple of animals real fast, and then we'll we'll slow the breaks down when it comes to um, the the carnivorous marsupials. Uh, so maybe we hit let's hit a diprotodon, let's hit um, the giant kangaroos, let's hit the fangaroo, um, and then that one creature with the trunk, or that might have the trunk. And then we can nestle in and pump the brakes when we get to uh, the last two big uh, showboaters of the session. All right, let's do All it. Right. So okay. they brought it down then. Right. I brought it down. <laughs> okay. I'd like to um, quickly, um, quickly introduce the whole renowned marsupials. Um, so just for everyone who you know doesn't isn't quite up to scratch on what exactly a marsupial is, marsupials are split off from placental mammals. Possibly when the dinosaurs were around, like Cretaceous era seems to be when that date's been put back. Um, so originally these animals, instead of giving birth to like proper babies and stuff, they gave birth to these weird little undersized pink grub little, I mean, I think imagine Dragon Ball Z, perfect, you know, little cell in his little, you know, incubator <laughs> pod. They probably look more like that. They these tiny little things would just crawl out. They're like the size of a, my finger, um, you know, on an animal the size of me. They crawl out, cross, latch onto the parent, the mother, and I think they latch near the milk nipples and stuff. And obviously at some point they would have also adapted pouches that were next to those milk glands as well. So they would actually hide in the pouch. So the babies, they do grow into proper size babies and they stay in the pouch when they're babies, but they don't actually, they're not actually born babies. They're born weird little things. And you can usually tell because the tail's usually extra thick, the hips are extra small because they don't need to be wide to make these babies come out. And um, so they usually have very large tails. Now, they were around all around the world at one point. Then they pretty much became isolated to North and South America and Australia. And North America have the possum, South America have a bunch of weird animals. And that's, and as they basically moved to South America and then to Australia, they started diverging more until we get to the Australian ones. Overall, marsupials look a lot like your typical carnivorous mammal. You know, they have the same general buildup of face, facial features. They have the, you know, the baggy skin and the same kind of anatomy overall besides the tail. When you get to diprotodonts, that's when things start getting really weird. They get these, they're these hyper-specialized herbivores. They're um, canine teeth have more or less vanished. We'll get a few differences later on, but yeah, um, actually, I have um, I have uh, pictures of a skull that I, they, we had a traveling exhibit, and they had a skull casting of a diprotodon. Um, if you want to throw those images up, but they, they do have those funky teeth that you're noting. Mm. That, that it's a very weird skull. It's a very fascinating animal. Um, and then are diprotodons, are they the largest marsupial that we have on record? Yep, so diprotodon, which is what we just showed, is obviously part of the diprotodons. They're the largest marsupials we've ever had. The largest ones grow to about the size of a white rhino, minus the fact that they're lighter because they have longer limbs and slimmer bodies. But generally the same dimensions of a white rhino, maybe a little smaller, is how big the largest diprotodons ever grew and obviously diprotodon is the largest of the diprotodontia so which is all the marsupials that most people think of um because they you know they only have like the all the big herbivore teeth you can see the molars have gotten really big and specialized the and sizes of you know taking these crazy shapes and usually they're really long so they can you know 
cut and chew and munch vegetation. They are the most specialized herbivores probably on earth. And yeah. they're completely they're Oh, sorry, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, no, you can see with these, like, just the skull, uh, you can see these funky teeth, and these are all mainly the incisors, because just like you said, there's a, there's a huge gap. The, the, the canines are gone completely. Um, and just the, just the way this whole skull is shaped is just very, very bizarre. Like, it, it's very, very unique of a diprotodontic, <laughs> you know? Yep. And quickly bring attention to the weird nose. Um, they have these big raised nasal bits and that, okay, so a lot of these animals were speculated to possibly have trunks. They found, at least with these ones, that's definitely not the case. There's going to be one coming up later that's a bit more controversial and you'll see why. But overall, they have really strangely shaped nasal structures. Some people even speculated they were trying to mimic rhinoceroses and actually have horns. There's ones with more extreme ones like Nototherium. Um, which is basically very closely related to Diprotodon. And there's also ones with giant, weird, wide cheekbones. I forget what they're called. But they took a lot of strange skull shapes, but generally they were the same, very large animals. They were, those other ones I mentioned were almost as large as Diprotodon, so they were a very diverse group. They took all different shapes and sizes, if you consider that the shapes and sizes are a large, heavy quadruped with a big, long head and giant buck teeth. <laughs> But yeah, that would pretty much sum them up pretty well. They were clearly land animals. They were the dominant herbivores of the time. You can imagine Megalania would have probably been dependent on eating these types of animals to survive. And the extinction of these things were probably the reason Megalania went extinct. Um, but they were definitely large, powerful animals. They were very common. I think we find them all over the continent. They were a very successful, very diverse group of animals. Very cool. Yeah, now these are definitely like right here. Okay, so right here officially, Diprotodon is officially the largest marsupial ever. By um, far. And, ha yeah. and having seen this skull in person, it's a huge skull. Like it's exactly as big as you noted. It's like as big as a rhino skull, if not a little mm -hmm. longer. Um, uh, what was the second species that you were talking about? Because this one's the one with the, the, the more larger nasal. Uh, if we're going into uh, that paper that we were talking about earlier. Oh, so um, so we jump into, um, if, if we're going to jump in the really trunky one, um, that's called, oh my God, I just drew a complete, complete brank. Um, <laughs> Palakestes. Okay, that, yeah, that's the one. Palakestes. Palakestes, um, Arsene, shall we should see the, uh, the skull shapes of it? Because... This one is one, is an animal, so this is... Um, this is so the this restored is, version, basically. Um, I'll version. just zoom in on that, and then after that, I'll switch over to the skull so we can compare it. Excellent. So now this has been a much more controversial one. Um, you'll see why when you look at the skull. This one had a lot of, and probably still does, a lot of good basis to assume it actually could have had a tapir-like trunk or some form of prehensile trunk. And what you can see there is a strange shaped animal where its eyes are pretty much to where its lips are. There was just basically a huge gap of the nasal. It was just had this really giant gaping, huge nasal, a lot of very broadened bones around it where the muscles would attach. And the actual part of the mandible which just jutted you know, without an actual upper nasal part way, way down and in front. So that led to a lot of speculation that it had a trunk. Um, maybe we can check out the skull just to see how extreme they are. So that's from the front. You can see the giant nasal pretty much going from top to bottom. And that's usually a feature of animals with trunks is the, um, if you sort of sit, sit it so that the mandibles are roughly horizontal, the nasal usually terminates way behind, you know, the, the all the teeth and sort of the incisors. And in here, you can see that it terminates, you know, way behind even the, the cheekbones as well. And you can also see that um, there's a wide, broad musculature around the cheeks as well that would face, um, you know, which the muscles that would form a trunk would anchor to. However... Um, so a lot of studies cited on Wikipedia don't seem to actually talk any which way about um, 
whether it actually did have a trunk or not. However, I did find a study um, that I haven't been able to read um, called Cranial Reconstruction of Paolo Kesti's Azale. And it's a thesis by um, Trussler um, printed in 2020. And this is actually probably the first one where they really analyze the skull features. Um, Peter, that's his first name, doesn't, you know, avoids going into too much detail saying that a lot of it's still speculation, but um, the main points I bring up that there is strong support for a well-developed prehensile lip in Pierre's ale. There is limited support for a vestibular proboscis. Many of the osteological correlates for a proboscis bu building as defined by Clifford 2003 are lacking. Both the form and distribution of the correlates identified negate a superficial appearance to the tapered like skull of um, Piazel and the confirmation of the retracted nasal morphology of it um, rules out the presence of a muscular proboscis of the kind seen in um, tapirs. There is limited evidence of novel narial elaboration, uh, but beyond that, further remarks are speculative. So this would be the first study of you know, going the detail about the musculature that seems to not overlap with the, what we know about how proboscids work. I mean, could there be some kind of strange novel one? Well, maybe not, um, but there we have it. So that is definitely food for thought. Like I'd say up until reading that, I was convinced that evidence for a trunk is very high, but I think given that investigation, like, you know, I think that's definitely... It may, you know, very substantial food for thought that unless we're entertaining a completely novel form of probos, you know, prehensile proboscis that somehow defies all the tests done, I'd say that's a pretty fair, you know, counterpoint um, to it having a trunk. So basically, as correctly pointed out by Martin, you can just um, nickname it as a marsupial tapir. So it, who knows? Like, I mean, it, can we or can we not? <laughs> uh, it's probably lean to maybe not. I mean, I don't really want to. I mean, they're not really that related. Obviously, they're different animals, oh, they're uh, but uh, not at all. But uh, because of the you know uh, superficial maybe resemblance uh, in some areas, you could just the same way as the marsupial lion, quote unquote, is not actually a lion anyway so not even close. it's not even close yeah but uh they still call it a marsupial lion so but marsupial tapir then it is <laughs> so yeah we'll find out maybe you know more more studies will be done and maybe it's, you know we'll find out more information about what exactly the nasal structure was but yeah it's definitely up for debate and that was a pretty good counterpoint that you know i have to be you know ursa saying well he's definitely got a point so, yeah, that's pretty much for the marsupial tapir or not tapir for now. I was about to say, so this this study that you just said, the most recent one in 2020, who was, who was the author for that? Um, so this is a thesis um, done by Peter William Trussler um, for the uh, Monash University. And it was, the thesis was posted on the 25th of, June 2020. So this is a very recent um, publication. Has it okay. actually gone into the full-on, you know, sort of journal, or is it just uh, in the status of a thesis at the moment, or was it actually forwarded as a paper as well, proper? It says thesis posted, so I'm guessing it's just right. thesis in terms of its structure. Oh, okay. Okay. Cool. Yeah, because I'm willing to take this at face value because the paper that we talked about was also done by Tressler. Uh, this is Trussler et al. 2017, where he says, description of new cranial material. This is back in 2016, so I guess they found new cranial material for this animal in the middle Miocene uh, camfield beds, Northern Territory, Australia. Uh, so this is a paper that he co-authored with Sharp, Alana Sharp. Um, and this one actually goes into more detail about, like, they do CT scans. They actually cover the interior of the nasal cavity. Uh, and then they have traditional sketches of the skull. Uh, so they do a whole seat, like I guess they got a cranium that they were able to do a full CT scan of for and map out the interior of the nasal cavity. So if it's Martin who did this study, 
who is now saying that the likelihood of a proboscis that's similar to a tapir is not likely then uh, that's pretty strong evidence because he's the guy that seems to be doing the most uh, advanced studies with this creature to date, I believe. So yeah, this um this is by Trustler. Um, so uh, yeah, I'd uh, but I'd say you know I can't really speculate on what was done, but it looks like uh, quite a few tests were done. So I'd say you know unless <clears throat> bar of you know reading through it with a fine tooth comb, I'd be prepared to yeah take their word for it at the very least. And it's yeah, also no. very recent as well. This kind of gives me the hint that there may be more coming up uh, sometime soon as well. I mean, soon depends, of course, because in terms of the scientific publications, the term soon is a very relative term. Yeah. It's Here. like, it's, <laughs> yeah, Josh would definitely agree with that because uh, yeah. you know how we were saying, okay, so there's something like as recent as, uh, well, I don't know, a couple of years ago, well, how many is a couple of years? Well, I don't you know, like uh, it's 2020 now. So let's say uh, 2016, like four years ago, that's kind of recent, right? So yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it is. So in paleontology, that's uh, a one year turnaround is a godsend. And on average, you're looking at a two to three year turnaround for a lot of these studies, sadly. Um, but that's that's paleo. That's how it is. Um, that's how it is yeah. So, all right, cool. So just a note on uh, on this animal, uh, what what was it called? I don't want to butcher the name. Proper proper low. Palakestes. Pal Palakestes, yeah. Palakestes. Okay. So Palakestes, was this related to diprotodons in any way or form, or were they were they their own little thing? They're their own little thing. They're part of the super broad diprotodontia, which I might mention includes kangaroos, wombats, koalas, and literally every marsupial most people probably think of when they think of a marsupial in Australia. Um, they were, uh, I think they diverged pretty early from the others that it's basically considered its own family, you know, aside from all the other ones. Um, and, uh, like it's Palakes did day, but it's Diprotodontia. And as you can see, they're sort of like, I suppose they'd be, <clears throat> I suppose wombat or sloth shaped. They're sort of seem to have like, I don't think there's a complete skeleton of one, but we have one where it has its head and its all its limbs intact. And it has kind of shortish limbs for its size and they have huge massive claws, but yeah. Overall, there's still a lot to learn about these things. Cool, yeah. <laughs> Would you say uh, wombats are its closest ancestor? Um, just within wombat. marsupials? It's hard to say. That's a bit of a gray area as well. That's um, going to be the case with a lot, a lot of diprotodontian marsupials. Is We know that um, kangaroos and possums come from one family, uh, wombats and koalas from another family, um, palakestids or another. I think diprotodontids might be closer to wombats and therefore these might be too. I'm not sure. Um, Obviously, a uh, big example coming up, Thylacoleo, no one's really quite 100% sure where it fits in because more discoveries about it seem to keep overturning um, what was previously assumed, um, which will come down later. But yeah, there's still a bit of a gray area precisely of how these animals related. Gotcha. Yeah, because I always hear these animals being spoken of, of like, the giant wombat. So I just want to see if there's any weight to those statements or if it's just kind of like a gray, like we don't understand marsupials. So we're going to go with wombat because cosmetically it looks like a wombat. You know? yeah. I think one quick, quick thing to say is I koalas and wombats are probably more closely related to each other. I think than diprotodon is, I think in terms of overall among diprotodontia, Protodon is closer related to wombats and koalas than the other ones are. I could definitely say that much, given that kangaroos and wombats are a wildly different group for that reason alone, and that definitely puts them outside. So there is some relatively closeness compared to wombats, but they're definitely not a close relative of a wombat. Gotcha. All right, cool. No, it's good to dispel that kind of myth because... That's what I've heard, like even on prominent scientific channels um, like Discovery and Nat Geo. So it's good to kind of get down to the nitty gritty, just like we do with Tyrannosaurus. It's it's just yeah. as important to do it with animals that are the large, it's the largest marsupial that ever lived. Mm -hmm. So it's good to know if it has a living relative or if it's 
pretty much its own thing for the most part. I think one thing I'd mention is that it is a fair thing to say, and it could still be true, but generally Diprotodontians are a massive family and <clears throat> they're so diverse that the huge like portions of it that are alive today are not, you know, vastly differently related to wombats. And so relatively speaking, yeah, diprotodons related to a wombat. And that, for that reason alone, I can't say if it's more closely related than a koala is, I'd probably lean to probably not because wombats, and I mean, they're probably maybe part of wombatiforms maybe, because that's the wombat koala group that other diprotodontids are considered to be put into as well. I can't really say for certain. They're definitely not like an sister species by any stretch of the imagination because we have those as well, and they're just basically wombat shaped. <laughs> good to yes. know. Good to know. So, all right. Well, I mean, we we touched up on kangaroos a little bit, and that. So maybe we just jump to kangaroos. Uh, let's let's because uh, this I want to say kangaroos are probably next to the koala. Kangaroos seem to be the flagship animal when you think marsupials yep. and Australia. It's like kangaroos. Yep. Um, so let's jump to let's jump to the fangaroo because that's a no actually no let's let's jump to the largest kangaroo. Yeah. Um, okay. So what's so what's the largest kangaroo that was around in Australia at the time? Okay. So this is actually a comparison of one of them though that very recently a new one was discovered that's even bigger. Um, so just to give a bit of context for this, this is a pretty good way of showing it. You'll notice the two on the left are the prehistoric ones and the one on the right is the one that's alive today. The one on the right can actually grow much bigger than that. Like it, they grow to massive sizes, much bigger than a person by a long shot, the biggest of that. So Macropus rufus is basically like to kangaroos what a moose is to other deer, just to give an <laughs> idea. They are like... So this is this is the current day red kangaroo. Is this the species Macropus rufus? Yep, yep okay. that's right. Red kangaroo. It can grow to monstrously massive sizes. They can get much more muscular than that too. They get blockier heads than that too. They're like so. What people usually think of when they see a kangaroo, and usually they see a red kangaroo, they're usually seeing the more gracile morphs like this one. They can just turn into giant beefcakes that tower over people as well. But this is a more normal size. So. A red kangaroo could get almost more the dimensions of the other two on the left, and they're the short-faced kangaroos. So they evolved completely differently. Like, kangaroos are also a very diverse group of animals, and a lot of the huge ones are more ones that probably evolved from a small ancestor that happened to grow massive. Um, these are the similar cases. Well, Procoptodon goliath, the middle one, is probably the second biggest kangaroo once was thought to be the biggest. And it's got a very robust build. They only have one single toe with a giant claw on it. They don't have multiple toes like other kangaroos do. The arms are much longer and they have much longer claws on them. They have a bit really hunched posture. So Roman's depicting it correctly. A lot of people think they can grow to three meters tall. That's not true. And it's because of the posture. That's all there is to it. So that's the exact size you're seeing. But the fact that it hunches down, that's actually what their skeletons did. They had a very curved back. And interestingly, they had a short face and their eyes face forward like ours do. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, because I, I, that's what threw me off with this chart. Because, like, I'm looking at the red kangaroo and I'm like, oh, that's a, that's a prehistoric giant kangaroo that I'm looking at. But you're actually telling me this is the average size for kangaroos across the board because... That's what I'm looking at. That's what I'm used to seeing as Pro Procroptodon being this giant towering kangaroo um, because of the posture. So people yeah. have exhibited it in the past to have straight backs. A yeah, straight backs, kind of like kangaroos do today when they're looking up on their feet uh, ahead of the landscape. So we're seeing that Procroptodon wasn't capable of doing that, or is it just more prone to be on all fours on average? So from what I know is that it could if it wanted to, but that would basically be because it's stretching up straight and reaching up for something. So in a normal posture, it wouldn't, it would be as the size and comfortable shape you'd see it. I think it can twist its back up, stretch its legs and stretch its arms up. But beyond that, it because they had generally curved 
postures. I don't, that's kind of what they would have scaled as, you know, if they were just sitting comfortably in real life. And red kangaroos, they're still quite a bit bigger than red kangaroos, but that's because they're more robustly built and they're a little bit taller. Um, so that's kind of the big key difference is red kangaroo, not because this is wrong, it's just that this is actually absolutely right. This is normal size for red kangaroos. This is a normal size for procoptodons. Red kangaroos can grow bigger in some freakish examples, but they would still be nowhere big as procoptodon for the sole fact that procoptodons are built like tanks. And that said, they recently discovered one, which is ironically related to the eastern grey kangaroo, which is the most typical one that people see in terms of kangaroo shapes, only it's just like twice the size of the red kangaroo you see here. It would have still been about, you know, probably only slightly bigger than Procoptodon in terms of just by sheer dimensions. Like we only have a few bones of it, so it's hard to say exactly how they would have truly scaled up. But I guess if you scale up a, a grey kangaroo, it would probably still be a, a fair bit bigger than Procoptodon for, for that reason. Okay, and what's this new species again? It's hard to see the names. Um... <clears throat> oh, it's not depicted there. It's um, so they're ones that have been known for a while. Threnorostrelingi and Procoptodon galia. They've been known for a while. This other species, okay. of kangaroo, not depicted, is actually a Macropus. So, oh. it's, so it is literally from the same kind of kangaroo as the red kangaroo, the grey kangaroo. Only it's just huge. And okay, so, so it's not it's not a short faced kangaroo like Procoptodon. No, no. Like it's it's just a giant kangaroo. <laughs> yeah, it's just a giant kangaroo. They found, I think, the um the humerus, I think. No, it's the um oh, what are the sorry, no, it's not the humerus, it's the arm bone. The um what's the shin bones? The um Oh the radial uh, uh the radial? Is it um are is it these two forearm muscles, right? No, two, it's not sorry, the, the leg muscles, the not leg the leg bones, the it's between the knee and the foot. No, this leg one. bone. This one? These ones. These ones. Oh, uh, tibia and fibia. Tibia and fibia, that's right. I'm okay. pretty sure it was a tibia and fibia. <laughs> I found the giant one that out, let, out, that out measures um, procoptodons by quite a bit. It's uh, actually in the same study. Um, I think it's called Sahu megafauna. Um, and that's the same one that disproved that the Aborigines killed all the megafauna, but it was instead a, a, an apocalyptic drought event that did it. Because that special late lasting super ecosystem wetland area actually was where this new kangaroo was discovered. Ah, it, was never okay. it was because of that particular miraculous discovery that we also accidentally found the giant biggest kangaroo ever. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. Cause uh, it's, it's interesting. Did they find any skele uh, skeletal like uh, teeth of this new one? Um, no, I don't, not sure, but from the bones they found, they're closest to the eastern grey kangaroo, which is a very typical kangaroo in terms of its, um, anatomy. It's basically, it's not, you know, like, it could probably be more beefcake than the eastern grey, because the eastern grey is a very ordinary kangaroo. It's sort of more lightly built, even though it's still strong, like, they're big kangaroos. They can grow human size in the larger ones, but... Yeah, I think from the uh, initial glance, it looks like it's basically just take an ordinary kangaroo and scale it up to a ridiculously huge size. Okay, yeah, because the reason I bring up uh, tooth morphology, um, we see it in um, animals like titanotheres, and we see it in animals like mastodons. They have these very sharp cusps, and that's usually indicative of tropical plant diets. It's, it's very strange. Like, very flat molars are usually meant for grasslands. Very sharp teeth are meant, usually notable for soft plants. Um, mm. So it, it would be interesting if they found the tooth morphology, because if they can find the, new, the tooth morphology for this new giant kangaroo and associate it to more tropical or soft vegetation, then that would work in tandem with the environment. Like the environment changes everything. So it's definitely when Australia went uh, more desert and arid with its environment, a lot of these megafauna disappeared because a lot of the vegetation wasn't there and it works up the food chain. Um, but it would be very interesting to note because that would be the smoking gun for this specific kangaroo species would be the tooth morphology mm. if they find the teeth. And that would kind of let everybody know like, okay, this is specifically the silver bullet that did this animal in. 
So yeah, they... I've got a few um, things, uh, if it's okay to quickly uh, address a few points in the chat before it gets, uh, you know, buried. Um, so first of all, let's ca compliment Harry on his gym attempts at gymnastics earlier on, uh, by trying <laughs> to lift his leg up. <laughs> and, I, like, uh, I was like, this, this one, this one, <laughs> no, no one. Is a, is a, that I was one. my arm off screen, so I realized I was doing the wrong thing until I lifted the leg. And um, then we've got two questions, one from Martin and the other one from Max. Uh, first one from Martin. Um, Procoptodon was, a said, was said to be a walker. Uh, was this uh, new Micropid a walk, walker as well? So what do you think? Um, I could say if it seems to be morphologically similar to Macropus, so it was probably a hopper. Um, I'm not, you know, I can't really say much about how kangaroos move, but keep in mind the average kangaroo um, going quite a long way, you know, backwards with the lineage, they, the normal way of moving is actually pentapedal kind of hopping, crawling sort of motion. They get out on all fours and actually use their tail as a fifth limb and they lift one limb up and stretch it over and then the middle legs go and then the tail goes afterwards and they repeat. So it's kind of more like a caterpillar movement. And I reckon overall the main form of movement probably might have been for all these animals, given that it's kind of just how it unusually seemed to have occurred to begin with. And they all have that similar stuff. Like they have the crouching posture, they have the incredibly long limbs. And so I can't really say exactly how they would have moved in all the different manners, but I would, yeah, say that it's really reasonable that their general locomotion was this strange pentapedal motion. Okay, cool. And um, uh, we got another question from Max, which is uh, an avatar, uh, the last airbender reference here, uh, which you could probably guess that it's going to be some kind of crazy mutant creature. So mm -hmm. uh, have they found any fossil evidence of platypus bear yet? <laughs> I think they have found fossil evidence of larger platypuses. But yeah, you'd have to go a bit bigger than that. And uh, well, then again, you know, with platypuses, you only need to get them big, and then you get a platypus bear with venom. That's a lot of things people don't realize. Platypuses are the last, you know, and the echidnas are the last monotremes to exist. So they're like m mammals so basal, they're practically just reptiles with hair and milk glands. Platypuses, their paw, their claws, they have venom in them. So yeah, they're actually pretty dangerous. <laughs> yeah, it's that back, uh, that back spur, right? That spur on the back legs is that yeah. the that's the one that has the venom in it, right? Yep. Yeah, no, it's cool. Like I said, Australia and marsupials in general, uh, they break all the rules when it comes to what mammals are supposed to do. So I wouldn't even doubt if this new giant uh, kangaroo species ends up being venomous at some point. <laughs> well, one quick note: um, this is actually another thing. So monotremes are like divergent from any kind of mammal at all. They were like, they're kind of more or less at the very beginning and they diverged off. So marsupials, if you like have marsupials and, you know, placentals here, monotremes would be like diverged way earlier. So they're like a weird, weird, weird proto mammal. that's just bizarre. <laughs> so they're like, yeah, they're just something else entirely. Um, Unfortunately, we get them both too. But yeah, marsupials, um, yeah, in terms of stealing homework uh, that you said, Josh, um, <laughs> yeah, this is where things really start stealing homework from other animals. And then you can start to see with a lot of marsupials, they just start making up the answers to suit themselves as they go. Although, um, so I reckon, yeah, we pretty much nailed kangaroos, I think. Um, we got the main groups down and how they function. We also have... Um, there's also what's a, what's a fangaroo, by the way? Can you because Josh brought it up earlier? So what yeah, is what's that the, all about? What's the fangaroo? <laughs> the fangaroo it, sounds like, um, it sounds like we're making stuff, but we're not. This is this is a real thing. Not. It's I think pretty sure its actual species name is fangaroo. What? Um, yeah, <laughs> it, uh, look it up online. Um, I think you go. Let, let me have a look. Find it. What? I'm, I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm they, looking I'll it up. As well. Hold on. I'll describe it while. Um, Arson's looking for it. So it's kangaroo. it's a really primitive ancient group of kangaroos. I, they might have actually existed before 
at the early points before um, Duck Protodonts lost their canines, or maybe it just regrew them from scratch. We're not really sure what it ate. It doesn't have typical predator fangs, but it has canine teeth that curve kind of down and backwards, kind of more like a pig's tooth. I'll be damned. Yeah, you're right. Bell. Okay, so the, the official name is Bell Belbaru Fangaroo. <laughs> Belbaru Fangaroo. And there you can see the the top ones are the actual skull. You can see it's tusks like teeth. So it's upper canines form some kind of tusks. I'm not really sure what it ate. It was a very, 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 very ancient species of kangaroo of a very oh. loose sort. So keep in mind, kang when we say kangaroo, people usually think of the sort of the big hopping things like the ones we just saw. They're only a very, very, very um, derived group of kangaroos. Most of them remain quadrupedal. Um, most of them today are quadrupedal still, and the early ones were definitely quadrupedal. We should probably, um, yeah, move because of the less appropriate artwork elsewhere on the um, search page. But <laughs> I didn't even see that. Arson, check. <laughs> Put your safe mode on, bro. <laughs> safe. <laughs> oh yeah, there it is, baby. Oh. Um. Oh, so, wow. yeah, you can actually see... This chat just got 100% more interesting, guys. <laughs> yeah, we're going to have to put the family filter on now. Um, but, yeah, so a lot of kangaroos were quadrupedal. The tree kangaroo from New Guinea was quadrupedal. And uh, Oh, man. <laughs> this, is why we don't, this is why we don't allow furries and paleo, guys. We get stuff like that. <laughs> Yeah, it's a species name and everything there. That's like, and the, the funny thing is, we uh, we all, we also have those same furries, you, you know, doing dinosaurs as well and doing pretty much almost exactly yeah. the same things, if not yeah, worse, by the way. It's true. It's sad, but it's true. Um, it's sad, well, but it's very true. There's a way it's to, a lot harder. Is if there's Every a way to increase. Yeah, if there's a way to increase this image and for this love of God, get us out of this image search, that'd be great. <laughs> yeah. Type in minus anthro, minus furry, minus, yeah, that usually does a trick. That's what I enter in in my image search. And yeah, that's the that's yeah. the more rare, that's the more rare uh, a twerkaroo, I believe, is the species name. <laughs> yeah, this is a good bit, thing to branch on with the fangaroo. It's a very primitive type of species, which probably still in the quadrupedal stage. There actually was a divergent group of quadrupedal kangaroo is. that we can't say fangaroo was predatory or omnivorous or was like a pig or what exactly it ate, but there are a group of kangaroos related to the musky rat kangaroo that grew large, like maybe, you know, small person size, I mean, Dog size. Dog size is probably easier. Big dog size. Um, and they lost their canines, but they grew really long in sizes. And, um, and I completely uh, forgot the name of them altogether, but they um, I'll probably link it later to us and he can put it on the chat afterwards. But they um, actually just grew the really long in sizes and they think they might have been predatory, but they were like more quadrupedal kangaroos, not true hopping you know, fang things. That's not exactly what any of these were. They were just happened to be from the kangaroo family. And that, I think, yeah. is probably a good segue to That's get to... Good. Yeah, I think now it's a good segue to get that pair of jaws you had, Josh. Oh, yeah. I think we're going <laughs> to do it. We're going to do it. So, yeah, I mean, as, just to as remind much everyone, as, I, as much as I want to talk about the fangaroo, I think we got to clean our palate after that image search. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Let's... Um, yeah, let's sort of. Uh, I might, I might uh, probably make this. Uh, I mean, I don't know. Maybe remind me later to bring this up on Discord so that we can uh, turn this into both an emote and also. Uh, uh, speaking of emotes, yeah, we will have to do that sometime because we haven't designed them yet. But uh, mm -hmm. we can also uh, uh, use this for meme generator. Yep. Yeah, funny enough, when, when we did that, our, our people watching now just bumped. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> gotta give the people what they want. Eh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's what it is. It's what it is. All right. Let's, um, I'm going to do a quick introduction. 
So, all right. all right. So this is this is the coup. This is what I teased last uh, yeah. session. This was a, the Coupe de Gras, the the ever famous marsupial lion. So these are are uh, a casting of the jaws of the marsupial lion, Thylacoleo, uh, Carnifex, I believe, is the full name. Yep. I'm gonna get a good. So you can see the jaws of this animal are very weird. Um, this is theorized to be carnivorous because I think like I, I told you guys last time, oh, they're, they're really weird to handle too. They're very slippery. Um, this is kind of like a like if a Dunkleostis became a mammal. For those who don't yeah. know Dunkleostis, it's um, the big armored fish with those big shearing teeth. They're almost like scissors. So the, here you can see this animal had those same shearing teeth, which were normally known as the carnassials. They became like this weird hybrid of like almost almost a canine and almost like pure scissors that they just they just fit together really easily that were just meant for sharing things. Um, probably, yeah, probably soft tissue. And then we had these huge incisors here and on the top that were actually very hooked, which is where the theory goes that the animal bit and did the puncture and probably probably was doing something similar to what saber cats were doing mm. uh, with that, that puncture and let the animal bleed out while they stalk their prey. Um, which funny enough, marsupials did copy that saber tooth, um, that saber tooth template uh, in the, in the terms of uh, uh, not Thylaca Leo, but uh, Thylaca Smilus was a saber tooth marsupial. So it's funny that the marsupials were, were copying both of those templates, but these are two very different means of accomplishing that kind of predation, which was the that puncture bite, release, ble bleed out, and then stalk the prey afterwards as far as the hunting method for a uh, thylaca leo. And then I actually have uh, pictures of the actual skull if you want to mm -hmm. put those up real fast because it's a weird skull <laughs> that we have for thylaca leo. It's a block. It's a block. It's yeah, um, a chunk of hair. <laughs> and this animal, so just to clarify, this is a diprotodont. That uh, Those hyperherbivorous marsupials that, you know, definitely were no going back. I mean, they lost their canines altogether. These animals decided to improvise by turning their molars into giant chopping shears. And, yeah, that's the skull. It's You can see it's just a big, round, thick block. And you can actually see something interesting too is that the skull sinks into those teeth a bit. So that's a, a factor that teeth, you know, the longer a tooth is, you know, there's some, you know, vulnerability to breakage because there's more length to bend. In this case, that's not the case at all. They have short teeth. The skull kind of dips down to meet them, the shape and a lot of the parts. So these are very, very powerful teeth and people probably wondering you know how effective was it really as a predator um you know compared to lions compared to bears you know was this really like you know that impressive or was it just you know oh wow it, you know a herbivore turned into a carnivore and we're just giving it credit for that there's been studies <laughs> on it you're gonna be shocked you're gonna be shocked this animal you know the biggest marsupial lions are about the size of a small actual lion or a very large jaguar their bite force has been now identified, and just to clarify as well, um, Thycosmilus actually had a very weak bite because it had, you know, simple jaws. This animal bit the, with the same strength as a gigantic lion twice its own size. So the biggest ant lions you get, like the the Barbary, the Kruger one, the trans, you know, the Katanga ones, those monster sized ones you get in South Africa. It bit this just as hard as them, and that's not even counting for the fact that it had giant chopping bill hooks for teeth. This is just its straw raw power alone. It already has one of the upper level bite forces of a mammal. And it's and it's a strength relative twice its own size of you know really powerful predatory percental animals. So this would have been a genuine nightmare creature that you know, had it have managed to get loose onto Eurasia, it probably would have very easily shifted itself straight into a niche without even trying. It would have, 
it would have been an absolute apex predator very easily. And it could have, and it was actually known, estimated to attack things up to three tons, even though this animal probably is only like one and a half. 150 kilos at most <laughs> and it was actually found with evidence eating a diprotodon oh really diprotodon leg bone um yeah that's a crazy right there you can see those huge carnassial teeth that just became yep. a shearing teeth right here yeah so, so so we do have evidence of um predation then with the diprotodon yep. wow that's yep. really cool. do we so, have a do we have a paper citation for that? Because I want to look up that paper later. I'll try and find it. Um, but what they found was um, just roughly summarized. It wasn't sure if it was actually killed the diprotodon. I mean, it's not exactly a stretch of the imagination. It probably did. But <laughs> it was definitely eating around the bone. And they do know that the teeth, no matter what the, they could have done to kill the animal, they did not like the chew bones. They nibbled around them and strip the meat off and actually because they know that because the reason they know that because they actually find these little cut marks that could only have been made by this animal's teeth just chewing around the bone itself so they definitely ate meat they were definitely predatory and they also might they also found evidence they, there's so much evidence about these animals it's really amazing they did climb they were pretty good climbers but they weren't specialist um, arboreal predators at all, but they could definitely climb trees. They even found evidence of them climbing rock faces because oh, wow. there was apparently a cave up a cliff in like some desert area and they actually found all these little scratch marks going up the side. And oh, inside cool. the cliff, I think there was a small family of these things, like, you know, different ages, different, you know, adults and babies and stuff. So they might have lived socially. That's, that's cool. really cool because, I mean, first, uh, shout out to this piece of art. So this is done by Mark Hallett. This is one of the best uh, mm. by like Leo presentations I've ever. It's one of my favorite pieces of art by Mark Hallett. By the way, Mark Hallett, amazing paleo artist, very underappreciated by today's newer generation. So if you want to oh, get in, yeah. if you want to get in paleo art, I, I highly recommend Mark Hallett. The guy is a genius. Um, mm. But it's interesting to note that we have, so we do have a lot of fossils of thylacolea because that's yeah, the thing that uh, always escaped me. I can't find a lot of images of the fossils for thylacolea, funny enough. Like I, I can't find them online in a web search. That casting of the skull was something I got to see in person that I took photos of because I just can't find a lot of the, the big, like the actual fossils on an image search i see a lot of the fossil the skeletal castings but like when you mentioned that we have kind of a growth series for marsupial lion i can't find that i didn't even know that existed until you mentioned it just right now um, um yeah it's uh i think it was cited in another study where i looked at the anatomy and they kind of tried to figure out what it could do and couldn't do and I think they cited, you know, evidence of it climbing um, through that little rock cave thing. They found recently complete skeletons of them, so they know actually genuinely exactly the shape. And it's pretty much what you see there, only the tail's much thicker. They actually had a huge solid kangaroo-like tail. Oh, wow. And they, um, and they would have, they found that the anatomy of the tail works exactly the same way as the completely unrelated marsupial, the Tasmanian devil. It's, um, <laughs> so they could have used them as props. They could have used them to help climb. Yeah, that. <laughs> they probably had a similar predatory strategy. They probably had similar predatory niches, just scaled up a bit. Um, they would, would have been built for power and built for... They were could have climbed trees too. That, that's a lot of things people don't realise. Tasmanian devils can climb trees they're not specialist and by any stance they're just like a quadrupedal ground lover that just happen to have sharp claws and strong arms so it can shimmy up a branch if it wanted to but so they're not like koalas in the same that they actually tested this in the study as well they found the specific anatomical changes that make it a koala suited for trees um neither the tasmanian devil nor thylacoleo had so this definitely wasn't going to be a drop bear it was going to be um is this no, the just, one, by the way? No, no that's a, that's the thylacine. That's the uh, Tasmanian tiger. Oh, it's yep. uh, the other one. Okay, never mind. 
the black one, <laughs> black and white one. Um, that's the Tasmanian devil. Um, but yeah, so Thyakaleo had um, a really big, powerful body. They know they figured out roughly that it was good for leaping, but not good for running. Although I'm not sure if that includes perpetual hops. Like I imagine that's probably what it might have done to chase prey. But of course, it was dependent on large prey, and that's probably why it died out. Or the fact that you know an apocalyptic trap killed it. One of the two. But um, <laughs> they also had really creepy um, hands. So they actually, their front paws, they had long, possibly long fingers with giant, huge claws at the end. And their thumb, if you've seen depictions, including the one we looked at, had an extra large, you know, sickle claw on it that it probably used, you can imagine it probably grabbed on the prey and sunk it in and latched on. Um, so yeah, they are, and they're also very recent animals. They're one of the, only went extinct about 30,000 years ago. And probably because of that same event, they would definitely you know, probably one of the most formidable mammal predators ever to live. And they didn't even have to grow that large to take down humongous sized prey, which kind of really puts things into a terrifying context. Do you think they could, do you think they could take down a Megalania if they were coexisting? Well, mm. I think they coexisted. I don't know, a bit of a stretch. I'd say no. I mean, the fact that Megalania is even there is proof that Megalania isn't, you know, threatened by the marsupial lion just because Megalania kept coexisting in the same place as marsupial lion did. Right. So mm -hmm. I think I think Quincana and Megalania were probably two animals that could have turfed it out if they wanted to. But given that, you know, it's not exactly, you know, robbed of choice, you know, a marsupial lion or any of these animals really... If they see an animal that isn't going to fight back or isn't going to be basically a giant monster-sized lizard or crocodile, they could easily take it down and kill it. They wouldn't have any trouble at all. Like one I mean, bite. Words, um, if I were there, I would probably get, uh, let's just say, um, totally butchered and destroyed by one of these like with no problem. Mm. Yeah, I mean, this is a scary thing. People lived alongside those little monsters. It's like, <laughs> I mean, this thing could just ambush you from a tree. Or it just jumps out of the grass and, you know, bites one of your legs off. I mean, they could probably have enough strength to do that. Well, I mean, it, or at least... Oh, go ahead. You know, at least, you know, they probably could have just cut through all the muscle, stopped at the bone, and then you would have basically had no leg minus the fact the bone still was there but you know they would have done grievous damage with one bite yeah it's funny that you mentioned that um you have evidence of these things on rock faces mm -hmm. in australia because we have animals that fit that kind of niche that live on mountains and rock faces um the most recognizable predator that lives on the mountainside that hunts specifically mountainside prey is the snow leopard mm. Snow leopards live on the mountain faces, on mountain cliffs. They have a big tail, just like the marsupial lion now that, that we know has it. And part of the functioning of that tail is to keep the balance while you're running down vertically mm. uh, to keep you from tumbling forward and just kind of rolling down the hill, uh, Acme cartoon, <laughs> like, a, like a cartoon. Um, so this, it, it might not be a question of aboreal versus a terrestrial or, or long grass predation. It might be a question of aboreal versus cliff face, because if we have evidence of a cliff face and caves being the, the dominant environment for a marsupial lion, that might have been its niche. The marsupial lion might have been like such a specialized predator that it was living in caves and dwelling on rock faces and doing that jumping down uh, hunting method because I, I don't I don't do rock climbing, uh, but I've heard stories of rock climbers that once you're on the rock, once you're up on that mountain, and if you get injured, you're pretty much screwed because you don't have enough you don't have enough strength to climb down because you're bleeding up. You sure don't have enough strength to climb up because you're still bleeding out. So if you're bleeding out on the mountainside, you're pretty much done. Which might be why this animal devised such a such a, a unique kill method to to stab prey and then just watch you bleed out on the side of a mountain face because either way you're screwed. And then it could just give chase because it was built for a vertical chase environment. 
Uh, so it's so it's a fascinating thing because I didn't know about evidence of it being on a rock face until you just mentioned it. Now it seems like a more viable method for hunting for this animal because because we have carnivores today that fill those specific niches as far as hunting on mountainsides or cliff faces or rock faces. Uh, even jaguars are known to do that, even though they are more or, or arboreal species. Um, They'll jump down mountainsides with no problem. In fact, they even hunt macaws, which uh, parrots and macaws are known to to nest on the sides of cliff faces. And jaguars are like, nope, screw you. You're still lunch. <laughs> because, <laughs> well, because we'll try to get up there. <laughs> well, that's an interesting point as well, because I think <clears throat> probably one aspect of marsupial lions is they um, appear to be very versatile because Australia, even though it wasn't always desert, it was mostly flat and lots of different ecosystems. We had these cliff areas as well that they clearly exploited, but in other areas, it seemed to have been much flatter. So it could be like jaguars that they absolutely exploited every niche they could and they used that predatory strategy in according to the environment. And uh, which is, yeah, it's definitely something to weigh up because they definitely did cl climb into caves and they climbed up rocks to get to the caves. So. They, um, they definitely could do it. Yeah, no, it's really cool. And then uh, somebody uh, mentioned real fast um, that uh, the <laughs> as far as the marsupial lion, they noted that it was, oh, did they delete the button? Uh, basically, they said it was, okay, Martin noted that it was basically a vegetarian gone wrong. Yes, this is, yeah. this is if you want to describe this animal, it was pretty much a murder beaver. Yeah, it, yeah. It was a complete because monster. It, just... it, it, it used these incisors. Beavers use their incisors to cut down trees, big trees. It's no joke to bite through a tree. Imagine that mechanism used to hunt prey, and you pretty much have fly like a Leo. That was this was a murder beaver. It would it would use that same jaw strength to puncture flesh and then let it go. And then, funny enough, looking at the. Um, Looking at the carnassials of this animal, I might kill one of these lights real fast just because I feel like I'm getting glare from one of these lights. Speaking of as well, when you mentioned beavers, uh, uh, since this is the last segment at the moment, at least for the Australian theme, how about in the future, since we decided to cover the more kind of less uh, talked about in public, so to speak, you know, in terms of the forums and stuff, less commonly brought up animals. Why don't we talk about the, I believe it's called Castoroides, which, which was the giant beaver of the Cenozoic, which we can do a live stream on as well, and maybe do a little bit more into them and see if we can maybe get more material on their relatives as well. Absolutely. What do you think of that? Yeah, that'd be excellent. That sounds good. As you can see, um, I try to grab this cast in my entire uh, storage area tried to destroy itself <laughs> so well, lucky it wasn't trying to destroy you <laughs> no it was it was, oh, it was okay <laughs> so here, here's that here's the lion skull so this is what we covered when we did big cats so you can see for a comparison those very large cane uh carnassial teeth so these are the carnassial teeth you can see how big they are and these are for shearing meat um this is the same tooth mechanism for a marsupial lion. So you can see what this animal was doing, which was very unique with those carnassial teeth. Um, it basically got all these teeth right here and merged them into one giant tooth. Um, so that's what this animal chose to do uh, because that was its feeding method that it wanted to do. And then you can see in comparison to the kill teeth on the lion, the bottom teeth of a marsupial lion was almost as long as you can see right there. Like these are very large shearing teeth that it had, these, these kill teeth, these puncture teeth right here. Um, so it's very, it's a very interesting animal. And even, even for something like predation to fuse your teeth this way is a very unique thing to do. Not a lot of predators do this. In fact, the only predator I can think of that does anything that attempts this, because you also mentioned the bite force of this animal, Harry, um, is a hyena. 
Mm -hmm. Hyenas actually have very hyper-developed carnassial teeth. There's one tooth they develop here that's right behind the canine that's known as the bone crushing tooth because that's the tooth they use to crush bones to get into the bone marrow. Uh, so I'm curious if for the marsupial lion, when it hunted its prey, it was using these, these, these shearing teeth as bone crushing teeth. Because uh, he noted the the bite force for this animal, this is this actually works pretty well for us actually crushing bones of animals with very slender limb bones, like kangaroos, for example. Um, like if he snap, it would it wouldn't take much bite force to snap that that bone into two and get to the bone marrow. So it'd be interesting to see if like this animal's hunting animals like rock wallabies and just mm. snapping those limbs in half to get to the bone marrow, like a hyena. So it, it was a weird like beaver, jaguar, hyena hybrid that we might be looking at here. <laughs> yeah, and just to <laughs> clarify from what I said earlier, the diprotodon bone that the marsupial lion did not want to chew through was like, you know, this thick, it, or the, it's big, it's a ridiculously thick bone. So. No animal was going to chew through that ever, but a thinner boned animal like a wallaby, I reckon it probably did. I mean, it has more than enough power to do that. Yeah. And I mean, given that it's power, it's probably powerful enough to actually insta kill animals. Like, you know, most <laughs> animals have to, like jaguars and tigers, they have to crush the back vertebrae because that's how they attack their angle of attacks, usually from the back. Um, I mean, this animal could probably just bite any part of the body or any part around the neck and probably seven the head you know more or less from the bite impact because those <clears throat> shearing teeth might possibly play a part although they tend to be so far back they're probably more for processing but yeah that's my one so that's an idea of how big that animal <laughs> genuinely grows and i had it snarling so it's like you can see the teeth but yeah that um yeah this is an animal that definitely had enough biting strength because of those giant cheekbones that you know are practically almost as wide as the whole skull is long um to really deliver a lot of strength in both in especially in the back of the jaw so it could have definitely exerted the strength and without much effort but uh yeah another little side fact about these animals um there's been a lot of speculation that they're wombatiforms or related to possums and honestly the jury is very much out on that as you can see it's kept its tail um it's thick heavy prop tail that you know seems to be a generalized marsupial feature which obviously all the other wombatiform all the wombatiforms have pretty much lost if unless you start scaling it to a larger family group the skull is actually a very, very derived skull from an ancestor of a smaller animal called the Wakaleo, which is like a primitive mus marsupial lion. And that actually has, you're interested to know, Josh, it's actually kept all the other molars, but they're all the same shape. So it has, instead of that one huge merged carnassial, it actually has a couple in a row that have like the sharpened, broadened bits and has a longer skull for its size. So this is, you know, the early process of all those molar, you know, all those carnassials eventually either merging or being displaced by that one gigantic tooth. Um, and yeah, but that's only at this point does this become the really heavy headed, heavily built, you know, kind of brick monster rather than, you know, more or less just a lean, sleek, kind of more panther shaped animal with, you know, more teeth in its head still. So this is a little, so in terms of where exactly it came from, yeah, it's uh, still a long, long way to go to figure that out. Yeah, it's interesting that you note that there's earlier versions of this animal with longer, because that's the thing that convinces me more that this thing was probably um, crushing bone or at least specializing to get through armor of some, maybe it ate turtles, I don't know, um, because when you go through the, uh, the, like I said, hyenas actually have a very shorter snout because they're broadening the, the, the jaw muscles up here. They're making those, they're compacting the muscles and the, the skull gets shorter. It's the same thing for um, the Tasmanian devil and the Tasmanian tiger. Like they have teeth that are the same size, but because this animal is specializing in, um, 
and making its skull bigger versus this animal has kept its skull length. Like, I believe the Tasmanian devil has a bite force that's greater than the, the Tasmanian tiger. But the teeth on this guy are about the same size, and the the width of the skull is almost the same size as well, as far as those jaw muscles. Like, you can see how it's just getting bigger and bigger jaw muscles. So that that's indicative of a larger bite force, which is why by the time we get to the marsupial lion, the, the proper marsupial lion versus Wallaca Leo, you can see that the skull was compacting itself shorter and shorter because it's definitely mm -hmm. focusing on on increasing its bite force. Like that's that's indicative of any species within mammalia. The skull will get shorter to compact those 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 uh, those stresses from bite force and these carnassial teeth that have been developed to kind of crack things. You know, I, I think we're looking at more of a, a hyena equivalent for the marsupial lion, ironically, <laughs> yeah. than we are looking for a uh, a a more big cat uh, reference for this type of creature, just because it's so like just looking at that skull compared, like literally the carnassial tooth is almost the entire tooth row for the for the Tasmanian tiger. Like that's yeah. that's insane, right there. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Like that, yeah. that's just a unique animal all to itself. And this clarifies as well, putting these jaws together. So the Tasmanian tiger and the Tasmanian devil belong to a similar family that are more typical mammal. And you see yeah. all the teeth in there. They're still intact. The canines are intact. And yet you see the marsupial lion derive, evolve from super herbivores turning into something with a vastly nastier dentistry than any actual specialist carnivore that, you know, came from the carnivorous lines. And so, yeah, this is, you know, this that really captures it. And just, um, and you saw with the skulls as well, and you can see with how wide the teeth are. And just to clarify to the audience, that is actually how long the entire jaw is. You know, it just goes back a little further than that with the, um, you know, the cheekbones and the cranium and stuff. But, yeah, that is pretty much... The whole mouth that's um and its skull doesn't have a long snout sticking out above it's um pretty much where josh's fingers are on the upper one is where the eyes would be it's uh, got a very compacted block blunt head that is purely based on power that is how it evolved it's all down to extreme levels of biting and chewing and chomping and crushing strengths probably so and I actually had the article suggest it sliced and diced prey. <laughs> it's just a, and probably, you know, attack and kill just by sinking the teeth in and the prey just dies just from the force of the trauma of having your throat ripped out in one go. So, yeah. Because yeah, well, you can even see, like, right here, it has more of a hooked canine. So this is definitely what it was hooking. And the yep. bottom were just meant for just stabbing, just continuing. Because yeah, yeah. these are the longer teeth on this this animal. Yeah, yeah. Like it, it's the bottom teeth that are the longest. That it would just, it would it would hook, and then it would just stab with those bottom teeth, just like that. Yeah. And then and then like I said, maybe it let it go, and then it just stalked it while it bled out. Uh, kind of like Komodo dragons, kind of like saber cats. It, it's it's a it's a tried and true formula. <laughs> for yeah, animals. even dinosaurs <laughs> probably did it as well. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of so, this, for a second, I wanted to go back to the point about the relative width and shortness uh, of the skulls and jaws in terms of how they try to have this tendency to focus all the force in a smaller sort of cross section area for the better. Mm -hmm. Um, for the lack of a better word, penetration, uh, because we do love penetration on this channel as well. But uh, uh, what I wanted to really uh, go to is uh, the, um, uh, if you notice how uh, the proportion of width versus length of the skull, if you look at Tyrannosaurus rex, uh, that's probably the similar sort of tendency it was trying to go into in comparison to other theropods, uh, specifically the, the if you look at even other Tyrannosaurids, you know, 
they are longer skulls in comparison and then all of a sudden you see t-rex that once you see the top view it's everything just becomes so much wider and more robust so uh, we, we don't know what would have happened, of course, if they continued evolving and if there was like another species of Tyrannosaurus that would have, if they survived later, what would have looked like after the T-Rex. Uh, but uh, hey, um, knock yourselves out imagining that one. But um, yeah, this, uh, let's just say marsupial lines to conclude were probably pretty disgusting when it comes to, you know, dealing with them for those who lived nearby in the same neighborhoods as them. I, I would not want to live with this kind of creature nearby. Just like <laughs> anywhere behind the glass window or maybe a cage, I'll be okay. But uh, uh, out in the wild, like hell no, I'm out of there. <laughs> well, here's here's the thing that's interesting because shy of the Tasmanian tiger, um, was Thylacoleo the, the one of the largest predatory marsupials that we have, Harry, in Australia, or just anywhere, really. Oh, as a matter of fact, I should have mentioned this. Marsupial lion is the largest predatory marsupial yet discovered. Okay. Um, okay, so cool. Tasmanian tiger, the, well, which we'll get to soon, um, there were bigger versions than the one we know of, but um, overall, they probably would have been about the size of a wolf, while this animal was like 120 to 150 kilos, so that's actually like as big as like a really giant humongous person just to <laughs> like, like you know kind of you know about the same size and weight as um the 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 guy who plays the mountain in game of thrones and all the guys he competes at you know, competes with in the strongest man of the world tournament pretty much that size if in terms of you know all the mass and all the strength and and you know like in terms of like it's hard to say because humans are more sleek, you know sleek and elongated while this is like a bulk down compacted thing so it's probably in many ways more like an orangutan you know because in terms of the general proportions because they like you know really thick bodied you know thick limbed thick, you know barrel chested short. yeah it's more concentrated uh, humans are definitely not like that or a small bear is probably another way yeah so, yeah, small bear, yeah. so it hmm? Yeah, no, I was about to say, like, skull size, um, because, yeah, th this is a good transition into the Tasmanian tiger, because the Tasmanian lion and the Tasmanian tiger, ironically, neither of them look like cats. Um, these are the largest carnivorous marsupials in the fossil record, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, cool. So, I mean, just, just to show you how much bigger this guy was, because uh, like we stated, uh, the, the Tasmanian tiger, which is this fossil casting right here, not fossil, the skull casting, um, this is the width of the palate on this animal. This animal is probably the size of a jackal because uh, wolves can get pretty big. I want to say this grew no bigger than the size of a jackal. I know we have some Pleistocene uh, thylacines that were bigger. Yeah, um, but they weren't too much bigger than the, the actual thylacines that survived until recently. Uh, but just to compare the palette for this thing, like this thing, the palette of this creature alone is almost the same width as the actual mm -hmm. skull for the Tasmanian tiger. Like that's, that's just the palette. <laughs> like that's, that's just the mouth that we're looking at. That's wider than the actual skull for this animal. Mm -hmm. that you can, like you can see right here. I'm trying to get it all on the camera. Um, so yeah, right there, like you can see the size comparison just for the mouth. Like that that's only this area right here. And it's already wider than the, the, the skull of the Tasmanian wolf uh, or yep. the Tasmanian tiger. Um so that that's just that just tells you how how much of a tour de force this animal was as far as like being an apex predator in the Australian outback during the Pleistocene. What, what was this age range? Was the age range the, the, the Pleistocene into the Holocene, or was it just just Pleistocene? Uh, so marsupial lions were kind of a more recent animal. They um, they went extinct, you know, 30,000 years ago. So I'd say Pleistocene or, you know, maybe... I'm not sure when the Holocene exactly starts, but it's definitely, you know, we only just missed it, basically. When the uh, Ice Age finished is pretty much when this animal finished. 
Okay, so it's proper Pleistocene then. Yep. Wow, that's that's pretty. That's a pretty impressive animal, man. That that this thing mm -hmm. continues to, you know, surprise me every day. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's shocking. I approached it with the assumption that, oh yes, okay. So this is the biggest thing Australians do. It's like, oh yeah, you know, we have to, you know, do it, make a big deal about any remotely interesting predatory animal we have because it has to, you know, be impressive. And I thought, yes, yes, that's very nice about the marsupial line. It's um, and I started reading about. It, I'm like, oh shit, this thing's nightmare this thing's actually <laughs> more intense than people are hyping it up to be it's really genuinely the real deal it's well here's here's where i come in because i thought the tasmanian tiger um was the largest marsupial uh predator to exist uh because i knew it dated as far back as the pleistocene and to find, to, to find out that it wasn't like i i i thought the Tasmania wolf was the maximum size that we were looking at for a carnivorous marsupial. So the fact that it's not, and the fact that it, 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 it copied the homework of a much more successful class of animal, which were canids, mm -hmm. and it wasn't the largest. We, we know that the, the Thylacoleo was the largest carnivorous marsupial, it just kind of astounds me to no end. Mm -hmm. um, which is very fascinating, like ju just seeing all these myths about these animals periodically debunked because they're not talked about a lot it already makes this whole session worth it just because we've we've already debunked so many myths you know just yeah. with australian paleofauna you know yeah and uh yeah like um it's uh, actually that's the thing that's what i kind of wanted to do was try to jump into these myths and that's why i jumped into the marsupial line i thought yes everyone goes on about this giant size, monster size, bear size, monster animal. It's, you know, because we have to make it as impressive because we have tiny animals here. And then I read about it and I thought, wow, it's, uh, so it's, so they were rumored to be the size of like a brown bear. And that's just completely not true. Marsupial lines don't grow that big. But yeah, in terms of what they could actually do, however, is really underestimated. It's, they truly are like, something like you know when you think about wolverines they're small animals <laughs> like they don't have they, they're not big they never grew big because they didn't have to grow big a wolverine could actually take down an elk by itself and just wear it down i've actually seen footage of that that you can see it on youtube um but yeah this animal you know grows actually surprisingly large like you know very large man sized easily or you know small lion sized and it has the output that could very much just usurp any predatory niche in any part of the world, provided it doesn't, you know, die of dehydration like it did here, um, just by being having that sheer amount of power that it can bring to take down disproportionately large animals that it can find. Yeah, now there's uh, there's a piece of artwork I sent you, Arson. I think it's done by um, uh, is his name Peter Schroner. Um, He's a really recent paleo artist. He's been doing a lot of megafauna, but funny enough, he did coloration on Thylacoleo that was more similar to a Tasmanian devil. Um, and yeah, th this was a really interesting piece of art that you kind of see more of the marsupial features mm. um, with this piece, which just, I I'm imagining the size estimate. So what we're looking at for this creature, if you want to zoom that in a little bit more, Arson, is um, we're looking at something the size of like a small black bear, maybe, as far as how big this thing might get? Yeah, very, very, very small black bear. Like, um, I know black bears can get to, like, I don't know, 200 kilos, maybe 300. So it would be about half that size. Like, um, So, yeah, but that said, there's a reason why Thylacoleo didn't get big. It's simply it didn't need to be. It already could prey on any prey animal it wanted without really trying very hard. So if you have a bite force enough of a lion, you don't need to grow bigger than a lion. You can grow the same size you are and pretty much exploit the exact same prey niches that, you know, the lion's doing. Like if it were to go to Africa, it could probably prey on all the things a lion could prey on, even though it's half the size and needs half the calories. So that's yeah, probably something. Uh, unlock the system commands to increase, uh, you know, the strength and uh, just cheat it its way without actually <laughs> building up the bodywork. <laughs> yeah, like that's 
yeah, they're just a uh, they're just a harsh reminder that life just isn't fair. Some animals manage to break the formula and exploit system command dot uh, increase ID, ID. Uh, by multiple hundred <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> yeah, I did. Yeah, key. because oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, I was just making jokes. Oh. <laughs> No, because here's the interesting thing. Like again, going back to urban myths, I thought, I thought the Tasmanian tiger was the largest marsupial carnivore. I thought dead second was Thylacosmilus, which was the saber-toothed marsupial that's found in South America, and then I thought dead third was the Tasmanian lion, not the, Tas the, the marsupial lion. So now we're figuring out like that the, the marsupial lion actually took first place. So it's it's yep. marsupial lion, Tasmanian tiger, and then yep. Thylacosmilus, the marsupial yep. saber saber tooth. That's so right. So that seems to be like the 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 like gold, silver, uh, bronze. bronze. Like that that's kind of how they fall into what was the biggest and the baddest of the marsupial carnivores per se. You know. <laughs> There is a possibility. Um, I won't go into it in too much detail because that's segueing a bit. There's an animal called the boar hyena, I think, that lived in South America that was massive. However, we don't, we aren't quite sure it's a marsupial or whether it's a one of those proto. I think called metatherians. I think is what a marsupial is. So marsupials belong to metatherians. We're not sure if metatherians are also marsupials. So anything from the fossil record that you know isn't more obviously a marsupial because it's you know in australia or something they're a bit of a gray area so if borhain is an actual marsupial and not just a metatherian proto marsupial then it would technically be the biggest marsupial by quite a long shot but because we're not counting it, it's disqualified we're not thinking about it it would be the marsupial line wow no that's that just kind of puts this animal into a whole different perspective for me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that, that's interesting to know. And we should segue into our final animal, which is a yes, test yes, yes. tiger. Uh, so these animals were coexisting. Now that we know the, the marsupial lion lived as long as it did into the Pleistocene uh, before it died out right before the Holocene. Um, Tasmanian tigers were around in Australia and mm. They survived for a while. I think it's credited that the introduction of the, the canids, which would eventually give rise to the dingo, are what outperformed thylacines in mainland Australia. And mm. the fact they survived in Tasmania was because they were kind of ecologically sheltered from the expanse of the dingo as far as... Um, so canids kind of outperformed marsupials because marsupials were copying the canid uh blueprint and then canids show up and said hey we 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 did this first guys we're going to show you how it's done and they kind of outperformed this animal <laughs> um, but these thylacines were getting very large during the pleistocene because even though the most recent animal was the tasmanian tiger there was a larger version of the tasmanian tiger that was around during prehistoric uh, Australia. Yep. It's yeah. So Sinocephalus, right? Uh, I think that's the modern one. Sinocephalus is the, well, the modern Tasmanian tiger one. The prehistoric ones are called Thylacellinus potens. And they were 25% oh. bigger and also more heavily built. Okay, yeah. Yeah, no, that's the thing I found was fascinating because they had just these larger teeth. Like I said, the thylacine had very nimble teeth. This was an animal that wasn't, uh, there was a myth which kind of led to the extinction of the thylacine, that thylacines were hunting sheep and big animals, um, and they weren't. Their, their teeth and their jaws just weren't built for it. Uh, they were more meant to hunt uh, smaller prey, mainly just small mammals, mice, things of that nature. Um, so it's sad that that's the, one of the main reasons this animal was hunted to extinction as recently as the 1930s, um, because it was one of the true last surviving Ice Age paleofauna from prehistoric Australia to have survived in Tasmania. And um, it's so fascinating. Like the, the story of the thylacine always fascinated me because it, it's, it's an animal that was doing things that 
no other marsupial was doing in terms of it, it not only copied canids but it did a lot of very marsupial things like there's footage of a thylacine that's sitting on its rear legs kind of like a kangaroo like that was mm. a function it did and it, it, for for the longest time it was called the 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 i think the the kangaroo like something the the thylus the tasmanian kangaroo i think it was called at some point because they would see this animal rear up like a kangaroo to just kind of look up and look at everything <laughs> like it was a very fascinating creature <laughs> all right so uh, guys just wanted to quickly ask uh, do we have uh, any more uh, things to cover or can we address uh, the questions and then slowly start wrapping this one up uh, where are we at uh, with the program we don't have too many questions left i think we only have one main question from martin because uh, there's a segue in antarctica but we're not talking about antarctica um but i will say that if you want to throw up that photo i showed you arson of that mummified thylacine Mm. Um, so this is a thylacine that was found in Australia, I think just recently too. And it's just been recently put on display at the Australian Museum. I don't know which museum. Really? Uh, but this, this is a thylacine that was found in mainland Australia. It was mummified. I believe it was found in a cave. Um, so it's on par with like finding a mummified mammoth or a mummified, you know, dire wolf like they find uh, up in uh, there, there it is, right there. So that that was a beautiful find. That's an that's an Australian thylacine that they found just recently. No, that is amazing. Yeah, and it, it's almost perfectly preserved too. Like you can see the teeth. It has the stripes. It has the coat. I think they were able to extract DNA. Don't quote me on that, but I know the entire genome for the thylacine has been mapped uh, officially. Uh, so we have the entire genome. Um, which for people who don't know, that's more progress than they've done for trying to map the DNA for the, for the woolly mammoth, for this, this terrible idea of cloning the mammoth. I believe we should be cloning thylacines. Animals were responsible for becoming extinct versus animals that died out during the ice age. Um, mm. but this is a really fascinating animal. And then, and then Harry, just to touch bases on, uh, when were dingoes introduced properly? Do you know, in mainland Australia? I don't. All I know is they were introduced um, by the ancestors of the Aborigines. I don't know if whether that was like, you know, the f initial migrations, you know, or whether that was a subsequent one. They were definitely introduced pretty early. Um, so they were probably already having an impact on a lot of the megafauna already. And um, or not, I guess, if they were introduced early, given the marsupial line, but um, they definitely were introduced so long ago that they're practically categorized as a native animal now, even though they were imported by people. I can't really answer that question beyond that. Okay, cool. Yeah, because that's the, that's the interesting thing about the thylacine in Australia. Like, it dies out pretty recently, mm. and then it only just recently went extinct in the 1930s on Tasmania proper. Um, so it is fascinating to note that this animal was pretty much, uh, it's likely this animal was outperformed at the end of the Pleistocene by proper canids if they were introduced by Aboriginal peoples um, uh, as early as the human, mig whenever humans finally migrated into mainland Australia. Yeah, that's, that's pretty much what the official story is. And it seems to you know add up is that they, Clearly, we're in the fossil record in um, the mainland, but they very much vanished at a time pretty much when they expected dingoes were starting to spread around the continent. Yeah, no, it's just fascinating. Again, it's a pity, it's a shame that we lost such a significant species to overhunting um, of all things. Uh, but it, it's great to know that we still have uh, remnants of this animal around for people to see that weren't able to enjoy it. Again, as, as early as the 1930s, the fact this animal went extinct in the 1930s is just astounding to me, you know? Like, yeah. it, like you hear about animals that go extinct because of just over hunting as, as early as the Victorian era. But at the 1930s, I mean, that's... 
we had a lot of advances in technology. I have books on on children's zoology from the nineteen eight uh, from the early nineteen hundreds, and they mentioned the thylacine because it's it was alive at that time, and the fact that we so poorly understood such a such a fascinating and wonderful animal and just kind of let it go extinct yeah. uh, just kind of just kind of astounds me you know yeah it's probably one of the saddest things that happened in this continent it's you know just there's such a really unique you know animal that um you know managed to defy all odds and yeah people basically just decide to you know systematically poach it as much as possible because it wasn't even so much over hunting there were actual programs to exterminate these animals yeah because, again they thought they were a hazard or a risk to livestock and people you know they'd be damned if they were going to pay for lost sheep so they'd rather grab all their hunting stuff and go shooting these these things yeah and that's and that's the sad part about it too the, these animals weren't even built to hunt sheep like they did not prey on sheep that was a complete myth yep um and just showed like the bias toward uh, the whoever was colonizing Tasmania at the time. And it was just an animal they wanted to get rid of versus understand. It's like, we don't, we don't want to take, make the effort to understand this animal. We're just going to wipe it out. Um, sadly, the same story that we've seen repeated over and over. It happened with the Caspian lion. We talked about that our last, it uh, was tiger, Caspian tiger. Yeah. Oh yeah. The Caspian tiger, my bad. No worries. <laughs> It was hunted to extinction because of a land reclamation effort. That was it. Like that's the only reason the Caspian tiger went ex went extinct was because uh, people would just wanted less hazards on land. That that was it. And now yeah. we've lost a lot, like a huge, very notable keynote species as far as an apex predator. Feed yeah. them the marsupial lion. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the, the people who hunted, that is, they should be all fed to the marsupial lion. That would be a pretty gruesome form of execution, actually. Oh, yeah. I would not want to be hit by a marsupial lion. <laughs> well, yeah. That's a story One. I would implement into my novel in fantasy that I'm writing right now. Feed people <laughs> marsupial lions. Yeah. But, so, yeah. but yeah, I think... Um, go ahead, Harry. But actually, it's a kind of ironic and a bit of a more fortunate twist of fate that... Um, something almost happened to the last surviving species of short-faced bear, which is alive today in um, South America and the Andes. They were almost hunted to extinction for exactly the same reason, only unlike the thylacine, they actually did eat livestock quite a bit, but um, they managed to introduce better farming practices and better conservation efforts. And instead of going extinct and getting hunted by farmers, they actually are making a huge comeback. And that's yeah. the speckled bear, right? Yeah, the spectacle bear. Yeah. Yeah, people don't realize it's actually a short-faced bear. It actually is. It's a member of the short-faced bear family. Yeah, no, the raccoon bear, as we like to call it. <laughs> yeah. And just to clarify, it's not even like sort of in the short-faced bear family. It's actually more close related to Arctotherium than Arctotus is related to Arctotherium. Wow, to... that's pretty notable. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, that's that's pretty cool. I'd say, yeah, I'd say beyond that, um, this 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 really uh, amazing fossil find um, is probably a good way to kind of kick off this session um, mm -hmm. on prehistoric Australia. And the thin, the funny thing is, we haven't even touched up on all of prehistoric Australia. There's a bunch of animals we weren't able to squeeze in. Um, mm -hmm. But this session is like four. I think we spent more time on the Pleistocene. And the uh, and just the Cenozoic than we did in the Mesozoic. With our <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's kind of what Australia is more prominently known for, probably because those things also have better preservations, and because of the more recent history, there is a lot more context that you can probably explore, which would explain the difference in the length of coverage. Yeah, no, definitely. But I mean, these these were in a, this. I I, I want to say this is an amazing session, if not to date the mm. um, probably the standard for covering paleofauna in Australia today. Because I've never, I've seen a lot of specials on prehistoric Australia. I, I haven't seen anything go as in depth as we have mm, just with I, these two sessions, um, yeah, and know, we haven't even covered everything. We don't do like any of the obviously fancy animations or like fancy panning, you know, wide camera angles and stuff like that. We're just sitting at our homes, just chatting shit, literally. But uh, it's uh, 
you know, it's the kind of thing that I do here. I don't, I don't necessarily do pretty. I just want it to be <laughs> heard and effective. You know, that's what I care about. I care about it to be loud and clear. So, and that's that's the focus here on the channel. It's not about making things look good and clickbaity uh, in only like ten minutes. It's like. <laughs> 10 minutes multiplied by a couple hundred and, you know, just less fancy, but a bit more focused on the actual information. Hopefully, at least that's, you know, that's the objective. That's the goal. Uh, and uh, let's, let's let the viewers decide whether or not it's, you know, getting the message across or not. And what we can do maybe to uh, improve. If you want us to do more stuff, we can think of something. If it's within our, you know, abilities, then uh, we can do that. Um, so there's that and uh, yeah i wanted to also um say that perhaps uh, once again to just double down on uh, josh's previous uh, references on this form of presentation that uh, seems like live stream is a very good format to do instead of just doing the pre-recorded um, video um so what are your thoughts do you think that more live streams on these kind of paleo sort of stream series would be the way to go probably onwards oh yeah definitely i'd say we definitely would probably whittle it down significantly because <laughs> i don't know if i have it in me to do a four-hour session every weekend um <laughs> uh, yeah harry because you're you're the one that's starting earliest of all of us i'm well into the evening now we started this in the afternoon oh, well, probably in the night already i have to talk talk you know tone my voice down a bit because people are already asleep and i also got an <laughs> eight o'clock like appointment tomorrow as well got somebody coming over to fix some things and i'll have to be up at 7 or 7 30 a.m not that i'm complaining, but it's just that uh, you know i'd rather not be if i got a chance but i kind of didn't yeah so i mean let, let's uh, let's go ahead and wrap it up this has been a great session uh call out to all of our uh our people that joined us on the live stream we have got to answer your questions as much as we could uh, Harry, if you want to sound off or recap, I'll bring up random fossil castings and you could just tell us what they are. All right. Uh, so we yeah. started with we started with this guy. Yep. There's a factinus of which Australia has sort of similar-ish possible relatives of, or at least morphologically similar specimens to. So there's <laughs> that. From that's yep. basically our um a recap of the uh, Mesozoic era stuff. We covered. Then, uh, okay, cool. And then we segued into this guy. Yep, the Megalodon. We had those as well. We also have Leviathan teeth as well. So, or at least animals so similar to those things that they would at least be in the very same immediate family. And then we segued into the reptiles. We covered the saltwater crocodile, which was around during that time and survived and is now basically the dominant predator of Australia as we speak. Um, we have the Quincana, which is a prehistoric, probably terrestrial crocodile. And we have the Megalania, a giant relative of the Guana and the Komodo dragons as well. And we managed to bust a few myths and speculate on a few points of interest about you know, what their evolutionary paths and morphology would mean in terms of broader animals. So we managed to even touch on the lips and teeth business. We, um, which yeah, is yeah, and then we, then we went into uh, this guy and his food. So this is the marsupial lion and we went into diprotodons that yep. show predation for the marsupial lion. Um, and then we wrapped it up with, uh, we did a lot of more stuff. You guys can watch the stream if you want a full recap. And then we ended on a good note. Well, a sad note, but an interesting note, which is the Tasmanian tiger. Yes, the thylacine. An animal that survived the Pleistocene only to be wiped out by hunters in the 30s. Yep. So this has been, uh, this has been fun. I enjoyed it a yep. lot. I want to let Arson sleep. <laughs> yep, thank you. Right. So I wanted, I wanted to thank you again, Harry, for doing this session. This was a great session for me to do. It was an excuse for me to buy a bunch of castings you don't even know. <laughs> Thanks for doing it. It's amazing to buy stuff so long as his wallet is not going to go completely dry, that is. No, it's been doing pretty great. I'm, I'm fortunate to keep working. So well, in, this case, in this case, you know what time it is. 
think of the next topic and uh, get Josh to buy more fossil replicas and <laughs> shiny <laughs> like Definitely. All right, so uh, in this case, uh, I'll do the wrap up here and uh, just say that I want to thank you both guys for uh, making it for this appointment um, and uh, for uh, uh, Josh specifically for providing a really nice um, replica fossils to demonstrate more hands-on and uh, for Harry just for sharing the context and knowledge and history of Australian um, animals in general, which is a very fascinating and one of the top probably uh, topics that should be out there, which it isn't nearly enough, which is why we are here. And um, of course, uh, I want to thank the viewers and those who um, liked and subscribed and everything else. We've just done everything, you know, the tremendous amount of uh, attention to the channel and supported it so far. And uh, I hope you'll continue enjoying this in the nearest future, so long as you do that we'll keep coming back. So uh, that's just how it is. Uh, so with that said, uh, thanks very much uh, everyone mentioned and uh, those who I forgot to mention, sorry for doing that. I'm, as you can tell, I'm really, really tired and sleepy, which I don't like to focus on very much, but that's just how it is. It's true, unfortunately, due to the time travel and all that stuff. But um, yeah, uh, I suppose that's time to wrap up the session now and uh, we will see you hopefully. Uh, I guess until the further notice, we're not going to say anything right now exactly. We'll just let you know ASAP once we know if we have any, uh, you know, availability and topics to talk about for the next uh, time once we are certain. So we we in agreement on this, Josh and Harry. So yeah. what's better? Yeah. We'll just let you know once we know better. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly. Okay. Cool. So. Uh, Hope you guys had fun and uh, we'll talk to you later. And uh, we're going to end the broadcast literally in a few seconds. Three, two, and one. And wave your hands. Bye-bye. Bye. Yeah.